Greetings. The U.S. Food and Drug Administration and our federal partners at the Department of Health and Human Services and the U.S. Department of Agriculture are pleased to welcome you to today's virtual public meeting on strategies to reduce added sugars consumption in the United States. I'm Lieutenant Commander Janisha Robb with FDA's Center for Food Safety and Applied Nutrition, Communications, and Public Engagement staff, and I will serve as your moderator for today. I am also joined by my colleague, Michael Kaczynski, who will serve behind the scenes to ensure smooth delivery of today's program, and you'll hear from him a little later. The 2022 National Strategy on Hunger, Nutrition, and Health notes that the intake of added sugars for most Americans is higher than what is recommended by the Dietary Guidelines for Americans and called for FDA to host, in collaboration with other federal partners, a public meeting on this issue. Today's event, as well as the subsequent listening sessions, will cover the wide range of efforts being taken by federal agencies, communities, and private industry to reduce added sugars in the United States food supply, and in consumers' diet. This meeting is an initial step in understanding the scope, current landscape, and stakeholder ideas around those efforts. Today, you will hear presentations that will provide background on added sugars and discuss strategies for reducing added sugars used by other countries. There will also be a series of panel sessions on current government strategies for reducing added sugars, industry approaches to added sugars reduction, and strategies for reducing added sugars in communities. As I noted earlier, following today's public meeting, we will host facilitated listening sessions tomorrow and Wednesday to offer participants the opportunity to provide feedback on next steps to reduce added sugars consumption in the United States. Registration to attend the listening sessions close on October 20th, and all registered participants have received confirmation and additional information on how to participate. We received several questions during the registration process and have shared those with today's speakers, as well as incorporated many of the answers into today's presentation. If you have any additional questions for today's speakers, please send them to sysan-coms at fda.hhs.gov. We also encourage you to submit comments to the docket by January 22, 2024. I want to share a few notes before we officially get started. The meeting agenda, speaker's biographies, and a document entitled How to Comment are posted on the FDA's public meetings webpage. The meeting is being transcribed and also recorded and will be posted on FDA's public meetings webpage as well. The recording should be posted within a week and the transcript will be posted within a few weeks. It is now my pleasure to begin our meeting by introducing Jim Jones, FDA's Deputy Commissioner for Human Foods and Cindy Long, USDA's Food and Nutrition Service Administrator to provide opening remarks. Welcome to our public meeting and listening sessions on strategies to reduce added sugar consumption in the United States. I'm Jim Jones, Deputy Commissioner for Human Food here at the FDA. We are hosting this event in partnership with the Department of Health and Human Services and the U.S. Department of Agriculture. We're here today because we know that improved nutrition offers one of the best opportunities for making people healthy. Right now, many millions of Americans suffer from preventable chronic illnesses such as obesity, type 2 diabetes, and heart disease. This has very real consequences for the quality and duration of life. In fact, the life expectancy in the U.S. is now far lower than our peer countries and continues to decline. And so we ask, what more can be done to help improve nutrition? One of our highest priorities at FDA is to help consumers make informed choices about the foods they eat. One area identified by FDA and that is in the White House strategy on hunger, nutrition, and health is reducing added sugars in Americans' diets. Simply put, we are eating and drinking too many added sugars. This is true even though Americans now have important information on the nutrition facts label about the added sugar content of food. And just over a year ago, we proposed new rules for updated criteria 
for when foods can be labeled with nutrient content claims healthy on their packaging. Under the proposed definition, to be labeled healthy, the products would need to containing a meaningful amount of food from at least one of the food groups or subgroups recommended by the dietary guidelines, and adhere to specific limits for, cer for certain nutrients such as saturated fat, sodium, and added sugars. This would be the first time we could include a limit on added sugars for the use of healthy nutrient content claims. In addition, we are in the early days of exploring how front of pack package labels could also make it quick and easy for people, particularly those with low nutrition knowledge, to identify healthier foods. These are in the aisle education tools that are intended to help consumers cut through the noise and find products to help build healthier diets. I'm very proud of the successes and momentum FDA has had in this space, but we know there is more work to do. And while we at the FDA have an important role to play, we are only one part of the food enterprise. It is going to require all of us working together in both public and private sectors to help make food about wellness and not illness. Forums like this demonstrate the power of collaboration. We each bring different tools and expertise, which, if we work together, we can leverage to make a difference in the health and well-being of our fellow Americans. Stakeholder partnerships, including with states, will help inform our approach and help to strengthen coordination of our policies and programs. Moreover, working together, we will be able to accomplish much more than if we simply go it alone. We are looking forward to the presentations on strategies being taken by federal agencies, communities, and industry to reduce added sugar in the U.S. food supply. We also want to hear from you. I believe to make the type, type, type of impact that is necessary to have a real effect on improving nutrition, we must meet people where they are. To that end, in the next couple of days, we will have moderated listening sessions to address key areas of focus on reducing added sugars. Listening and learning from you about what you think works and doesn't work is invaluable, especially early in the process as we are just beginning to chart a path forward. Today's meeting, our listening session, and the feedback we get from the doc at FDA opens to compile feedback, as well as our ongoing work with stakeholders are all critically important to ensuring that our next steps lead us to a, toward effective programs and policies that help to make our nation healthier. Thank you to all our presenters and to all of you for joining us. We appreciate your being here to join us for, in this important work. Welcome. Thanks so much for joining us today. My name is Cindy Long, and I serve as administrator of USDA's Food and Nutrition Service. Through our nutrition assistance programs, FNS serves one in four Americans, helping to ensure that those in need have enough food to eat. But we know that it's not enough simply to provide people with food. We need to connect them with nutritious food that promotes good health. Our vision is of an America where everyone has consistent and equitable access to healthy, safe, and affordable food that is essential to optimal health and well-being. That's why we're excited today to work with Deputy Commissioner Jones and his incredible team at the U.S. Food and Drug Administration to support this effort to identify strategies to reduce added sugar consumption. This effort offers a unique opportunity for us to listen, learn, and explore the wide range of efforts taken by like-minded federal agencies, local communities, and private industry to encourage reduced consumption of added sugars. Collaboration is crucial to that shared goal. You know, last year, FNS developed a proposed update to the nutrition standards for school meal programs. As part of that process, we relied heavily on FDA's research, science, and experience. For the first time, the proposed updates include limits on added sugars in school meals, according to science-based recommendations from the Dietary Guidelines for Americans, as well as extensive feedback from a cross-section of stakeholders. You know, the school meal programs reach 30 million children across the country on an average day. So any improvement to the nutrition of these meals has the potential for broad and significant impacts on child health. The research shows that a stunning 70 to 80% of the school-aged children in this country consume more than the advised limit of added sugars. 
So it's understandable that added sugars in school meals, particularly in school breakfasts, are a significant concern for many, including parents, teachers, healthcare providers, and really anyone with a stake in children's health and well-being. That's an example of why today's dialogue is so important and why your input is so vital. We've learned that getting feedback from a wide spectrum of stakeholders and perspectives is the only way we can fully grasp what's happening on the ground and move forward. It helps us determine how to best serve our mutual goals through sound and well-informed policy. We also know that while policy is critically important, it can only get us so far. Partnerships are integral to moving the needle. We need the private and nonprofit sector to join us as well. For example, this past spring, the International Dairy Foods Association established the Healthy School Meals Commitment to reduce calories and added sugar in flavored milk that's provided to school meal programs. So beginning in school year 25-26, 37 milk processors representing more than 90% of the volume of school milk in the US have pledged to voluntarily limit added sugars in their school milk products. This is a step toward our shared goal and we hope to see more commitments from the private sector. We need action by a wide range of stakeholders to move us closer to our goal of reducing excess added sugar consumption. I know the work you'll be doing here will help us identify strategies to achieve just that. I also know that this event has been intentionally designed to hear your voices, to learn from your collective circumstances and experiences, and translate that feedback into action that promotes healthy lifestyles. The insights you'll provide will propel us forward. I also want to note that there are several members of the food and nutrition staff here today to listen, to share, and to support this work. It is essential to our mission. So thank you again to the FDA team for inviting FNS to participate. And most importantly, thanks to all of you for joining us during this meeting and dedicating your valuable time, your expertise, and your passion to this cause. I know it will be well worth the effort. Thank you so much for those remarks, Deputy Commissioner Jones and Administrator Long. I'll now like to turn it over to our next set of speakers, Captain Blakely Fitzpatrick, Director of the Division of Nutrition Programs in FDA's Office of Nutrition and Food Labeling, and Dr. Heidi Blank, Obesity Prevention and Control Branch Chief in CDC's Division of Nutrition, Physical Activity, and Obesity. They'll discuss added sugar's history and the current landscape from FDA and CDC's perspective. Captain Fitzpatrick and Dr. Blank, I'll turn it over to you now. Thank you, Lieutenant Commander Robs. I'm very pleased to have the opportunity to provide some background information on recommendations related to added sugars, as well to discuss the labeling of added sugars and FDA's education materials on added sugars. The Dietary Guidelines for Americans is the cornerstone of federal nutrition policy and nutrition education activities. It provides food-based recommendations to promote health, help prevent diet-related disease, and meet nutrient needs. The U.S. Department of Health and Human Services and the U.S. Department of Agriculture jointly publish the Dietary Guidelines every five years. Since the very first edition was issued in 1980, the Dietary Guidelines have recommended limiting sugars in the diet. You can see a list of key recommendations here related to limiting sugars. Since 2005, the Dietary Guidelines have included a key recommendation that discusses the concept of added sugars. The 2015 to 2020 edition provided a quantitative intake recommendation for added sugars for the first time that recommended limiting calories from added sugars to less than 10% of calories per day. The Nutrition Labeling and Education Act mandated nutrition labeling in 1990. It provides explicit authority for nutrition labeling. It requires the disclosure of certain nutrients it provides some discretion to add or remove nutrients that are required to be declared on the label, and it requires that information be provided in the context of the total daily diet. 
We established requirements for the Nutrition Facts label in 1993, and in 2016, we updated the Nutrition Facts label that had largely remained unchanged for more than 20 years. Many manufacturers updated their labels right away, but, we ha but all had to be in compliance with the updated requirements by 2021. One of the major changes that we made was to require the mandatory declaration of the amount and the percent daily value for added sugars for the first time. In determining that the added sugars declaration should be mandatory on the label, we considered information such as consumption data showing that Americans are consuming many cal too many calories from added sugars, information showing that consuming too much added sugars makes it difficult to meet nutrient needs within calorie limits, scientific evidence supporting the 2015 Dietary Guidelines Advisory Committee conclusion that there is strong evidence that a healthy dietary pattern characterized in part by lower intakes of sugar-sweetened foods and beverages are associated with a decreased risk of cardiovascular disease relative to less healthy dietary patterns, and scientific evidence supporting the 2010 Dietary Guidelines Advisory Committee conclusion that there is strong evidence that children who consume sugar-sweetened beverages have an increased risk of adiposity or body fat. We also established a daily value for added sugars of 50 grams for adults and children four years of age and older, and 25 grams for children one through three years of age. We based the daily value on the underlying evidence supporting the 2015 Dietary Guidelines Advisory Committee recommendation, which was also a recommendation in the 2015 to 2020 Dietary Guidelines for Americans, to limit calories from added sugars to less than 10% of calories per day. The original label had information about sugars, and on the new label, this is now listed as total sugars. The total sugars amount declared in grams on the label includes both the naturally occurring and added sugars in a serving of the product. Beneath the total sugars amount, there's an indented line that says includes and the number of grams of added sugars, along with a percent daily value for added sugars. Having the word includes indicates that added sugars is a subcomponent of total sugars. We've also removed part of the hairline between the total sugars and added sugars lines to help consumers understand that added sugars are included in the declaration of total sugars. Our definition of added sugars includes sugars that are added during the processing of foods and food packages and containers of sweeteners such as table sugar, maple syrup, or honey. We've provided enforcement discretion for certain foods and ingredients related to the added sugars declaration. More information about our enforcement discretion can be found in guidance documents on the FDA website. After updating our regulations for the Nutrition and Supplement Facts Labels, FDA launched the new Nutrition Facts Label What's In It For You education campaign to raise awareness about the changes of the Nutrition Facts Label to increase its use and help consumers, healthcare professionals, and educators learn how to use it as a tool for maintaining healthy dietary practices. The education materials developed by the agency included materials on added sugars. The interactive food label is provided in both English and Spanish, and it has five sections, including what is on the label, the ingredient list, a nutrition glossary, resources, and fact sheets. The interactive label tells what total and added sugars are, where they're found, what they do, health facts, and action steps for reducing added sugars in your diet. We also have fact sheets on a variety of topics, including added sugars, as well as a web page about added sugars. You can find these materials and education materials for physicians and healthcare professionals, health educators, materials for youth and youth educators, and much more on the FDA website. Thank you. Thank you to the organizers for inviting me today. I'm going to be providing an overview of added sugars intake, including national and state data findings. 
I'm in the Division of Nutrition, Physical Activity, and Obesity, and our mission is to lead efforts to support healthy eating and active living for all people by advancing public health strategies. A key public health strategy for us is nutrition surveillance. We provide state-level nutrition surveillance data, including behaviors, policies, and system supports. And we use this data for action and equity, including supporting food and nutrition security to achieve health equity through state and local programs. Today, we're going to talk about reducing consumption of added sugars by people aged two and over as a leading health indicator and the work that CDC does to support this. First, I'm going to start with a current landscape on the National Survey of Children's Health, or NSCH. This is a national survey on the physical and emotional health of U.S. children conducted by the U.S. Census through HRSA. This is national and state level estimates for children 0 to 17 years of age. We are very excited to be able to partner with HRSA to add five new questions to the 21, 22, and 2023 surveys for children 1 to 5, including an oversample to look at state data. And we included a question on sugary drink intake. We published the data in February of 2023, and this slide shows that from the data we have, the percentage of children aged one to five who had consumption of sugar-sweetened beverages in the past seven days was 57.1%. And states varied on the three dietary practices. To the right, you can see on the slide, this is consumption of any sugar-sweetened beverages in the past seven days by state. We have high consumption, including between 70 and 80% in some of our southern states, including Mississippi and Oklahoma. Another data source for looking at added sugars intakes is NHANES. The data we included here is from the 2015 to 2018 surveys, and this included data on 5,280 youth ages 2 to 19 years. We wanted to examine the characteristics of kids who reported high intakes of added sugars, the eating occasions, and their top sources of added sugar intake. To define this, we looked at what we called high consumers, and this was kids consuming at least 15% of total daily calories from added sugars, and that is 1.5 times higher than the 2020 to 2025 Dietary Guidelines for Americans recommendation of less than 10% of total daily calorie intake. When we looked at the eating occasions and top five sources among kids, we see that snacks, dinner, lunch, and breakfast um, make up that high contribution of eating occasions. And when we look at the top sources of added sugars in children, we see this includes sugar-sweetened beverages, sweet bakery products, candy, other desserts, and ready-to-eat cereals. When looking at uh, specific factors of children and adolescents, we do find there are differences by age. So example, older children having higher consumption than younger. We see some differences by race ethnicity. So for example, here, uh, over 40% among black non-Hispanic children and uh, white non-Hispanic children. And also by uh, household education. So for example, uh, children who were from households with a high school or some college education of their caregivers had almost 40% intake. Another survey we look at is the Youth Risk Behavior Survey, or what we call YRBS. This is a national survey that tracks behaviors that can lead to poor health in U.S. students who are in grades 9 through 12, so that is high school. This is conducted every other year, and it's a national sample supported by the CDC. This includes students from both private and public high schools. There are a number of questions uh, that are filled out within the classroom, including dietary behaviors, injuries, tobacco use, alcohol, and other drug use and graphs and data can be looked at at the YRBS Explorer. Here are some examples of the data. So looking at the proportion of high school students who drank a can, bottle, or glass of soda or pop one or more times per day, you can see in this graph, looking at data from 2007 to 2021, that we actually have a reduction in consumption, 33.8%, for example, in 2007 down to 14.7% in 2021. And again, this is like looking at soda or pop. Looking at the same data about different demographic characteristics, we can see we see slightly increased consumption among males versus females. We do see some race ethnic groups having higher consumption, including American Indian or Alaska Indian or Alaska Native. Um, there's not very much different by grade, 9th through 12th. Um, again, with around about a 12 to 15 percent intake. When we look at the data for high school students who drank a can, bottle, or glass of a sports drink one or more times per day, we can see, for example, this has stayed roughly the same between the years of 2015 to 2021. In the graph on the slide, we can see in 2015, it was about 13.8 percent, with a modest reduction in the 2021 data at 11.2 percent. 
And again, this is sports drinks, which include Gatorade, Powerade, and not counting low-calorie sports drinks, such as Propel or G2, during the last seven days before the survey. Looking at adults, we use the same information provided earlier for kids from 600 uh, U.S. adults that were 20 years or older. Again, we defined high consumers by looking at at least 15% of total daily calorie intake from added sugars. And again, we use the Dietary Guidelines for Americans recommendation to create that definition. When we look at the eating occasions and top 10 sources of added sugars among U.S. adults, again, very similar to what we see with kids and adolescents, uh, we see a percentage of a contribution, the highest among snacks, then dinner, lunch, and then breakfast. Um, slightly different top five sources among adults. You can see here that includes sweetened beverages, teas, sweet baking products, jam, syrups, and sugars, and fifth being candy. Looking at sociodemographic information among the adults in the NHANES sample, we do see some differences uh, by various characteristics. So for example, here we do see high consumption around 30% among those less than 70 years of age. We do see some differences by race ethnicity. So again, the black non-Hispanic adults at 39.1 um, and some uh, lower consumption among those who have other race ethnicity. Looking at education, uh, we see that those who have less than a college education uh, have high consumption. Again, 36.8 uh, among those less than high school, 38.3 with a high school education, and 34% have some college. So slightly higher than the average that we saw for high consumers. Uh, continuing to look at other information in adults, we do see there's a slight difference by those uh, based on marriage status with those not married, having 33.4% of having high consumption, and then also some differences by household income using the federal poverty income ratio. So for example, those less than the 350th percentile having about a 35.1, and those with less than the 130th, 38.8. We did not see significant differences by sex or weight status. There's not a lot of information uh, on adults uh, by, uh, by daily intake, but we were able to combine data from the National Health Interview Survey, the NHIS. This is data from the 2010 and 2015 surveys that were supported by National Cancer Institute on the Cancer Control Supplement. By combining those two uh, sets of data, we do find that overall 63% of U.S. adults reported consuming sugar-sweetened beverages one or more times per day. Um, when we looked at what they were consuming, 39.5% uh, reported sweetened coffee and tea drinks, about 19.5% regular soda, uh, a little smaller percentages here for our fruit drinks, 5.7, and sports energy drinks, 5.5. The map on our, our slide here shows the data we have by state, the lowest consumption coming in in Alaska, with higher consumptions here in some of our um, mid to mountain states, Wyoming, South Dakota, uh, also increases in Hawaii, Arkansas, and South Carolina. Um, so again, it was really uh, important for us to show this data by state because there are state solutions as well. In addition to the behavioral data, we also have data on policy systems and environment. So as I mentioned, uh, among our public health strategies for DMPAO is supporting state and local programs. Among the interventions that we support in our state programs include including nutrition standards and early care and education systems. This can include state licensing, quality rating, and professional development. We use the Caring for Our Children standards that are national, and we look at things like physical activity, breastfeeding, fruits and vegetables, fruits and vegetables added sugars and water. And reports that we put out annually include our national licensing. So you can look at our surveillance and policy tracking on the website provided here. We also provide data on food service guidelines. Food service guidelines include nutrition standards for things like fruits and vegetables, added sugars, and water. And these are guidelines that can be included in work sites, hospitals, park and recreation, as well as food banks and pantries, juvenile justice centers, and other venues. And I've provided a link on the slide that can look at state and local policy data. For uh, other information, please take a look at our data trends and maps, which allows you to create your own uh, data outputs related to things, including sugary drinks, our state and community media center, which allows you to look at information to promote social marketing around improving nutrition behaviors, our websites related to our local programs, other social media, 
And if you're interested in joining uh, our Nutrition and Obesity Policy Research and Evaluation Network, where you can hear about more information, including surveillance and applied research, I've included the information here on the slide. Thank you very much. Thank you so much for your presentations, Captain Fitzpatrick and Dr. Blank. Next, I would like to turn it over to Mr. Frederick Robinson, COO of Blackheart Association, to discuss his personal journey with reduced added sugars intake. Good morning. Thank you guys so much for having me and uh, allowing me this opportunity to share my journey uh, along this road to consuming less added sugars or a healthier diet, so to speak. And um, so how it all started, um, I was, I've always been sort of kind of health conscious, but uh, it kind of shifted into overdrive in 2014 after my wife suffered three heart attacks. And, you know, the cardiologist flat out told us, hey, if you guys, if you want, if you want to get to the other side of this, then you're going to have to make a lot of changes. And, you know, in my mind, it's like, oh, okay, not too bad. We can do that. Uh, we already eat pretty good. And then we went to a restaurant for the first time after uh, being released, and we started running down the menu, and my wife literally cried in the restaurant because so much of what we had been used to eating and, and enjoying was now off the table. And that's when it really got real, like, oh, oh we really got to make some changes. And, and you know, we, we, we lived this struggle day to day. We live with the challenges day to day. And we really, um, it's a lot of work, you know, but it's worth it. Um, I mean, you think about the, the things that we're accustomed to eating, especially as black people, you know. We are so connected to food. Uh, food is our love language most of the time. And we, um, you know, we just enjoy our food. So. The, one of the biggest struggles for us is now that we've made a lot of changes, now that we've gone uh, more plant-based, is we're losing friends, so to speak. <laughs> you know, we're, we're losing that, that social connection to people because uh, I think when we leave the house, especially for me, and my wife laughs at me all the time because I'm, I'm that guy that's like, okay, I know we have this party coming up or someone's birthday, but I'm not going because there's going to be cake. There's going to be cookies and ice cream. There's going to be so on and so forth. And I know me. I'm, my, I'm weak. When it comes to those type of things, I struggle tremendously. So I'm that guy that will say, you know what, I'll be here when you get back because I know that I'm going to give in to the temptation. Uh, but what kind of life is that, right? You know, how, how, do you, how do you find joy and happiness if all you're doing is avoiding those environments with the people that you love because of your struggle with uh, particular food consumption. So that's a big struggle for me. That's a big struggle, the social piece. In African Americans, you know, we're so culturally connected to food for so long. It's been how we, uh, our excuse to gather, our excuse to, to come together and, and fellowship and love on each other, hug on each other. We're going to have a big spread. We're going to have you know, the mac and cheese and the, the greens with the with the ham hocks and, you know, uh, and my aunt, who is the, the best pound cake baker in the country, uh, is going to come in with her pound cakes and, and the sweet potato pies, you know, and, and that's, that's just what we do. That's what we've always done. So as we walk this road of a, of a healthier lifestyle, you know, for my wife's sake and for my sake, um, you know, a lot of those things we, we struggle with, how do we show up, you know, and, and enjoy ourselves in the midst of our loved ones while also staying conscious about, hey, we have to do this because, you know, if, if we're going to survive, we have to do this. If we're going to be healthy and um, alive versus just, you know, existing, then this is something we're going to have to, you know, really, really work towards and, and stay focused on. So that piece of it is one of the biggest struggles um, for myself and my wife because we, we both have large families and we love family time. It's just trying to uh, weave in, you know, some healthier food options into those environments because, you know, <laughs> people, 
people are people are mean and people are are very particular about their food. Um, so when I walk in with the, you know, with the with the uh, jackfruit barbecue ribs, I'm getting the side eye like, where are you going with that? <laughs> you know, and, and getting people to try those kind of things is 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 tough. You know, again, because you want to be a part of the environment, you want to be a part of the fellowship, but you also want to make sure that not only from for me and my wife trying to live healthier, also we try to, you know, we try to open that up to other people and because we love them and want them to be here too. So um, just that social, cultural thing is, is one of the struggles we face. But, you know, we make it work. Um, I miss a lot of functions <laughs> because she's a little bit stronger than me. Um, cookies and cakes, I'm, you know, all bets are off when it comes to that stuff. So if there's going to be a lot of that around, I tend to kind of shy away from those events, and, and she has a little bit more restraint. So she shows up in, in, you know, in representation of our household a lot of times. Um, so, yeah, I'm, I'm grateful for her for that. Um, you know, it, 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 it's, it's really it's tough. You know, and, and then with the work that we do, uh, we're two family, you know, two income household. Um, so the the cost piece of it all isn't really that huge of a deal for us, but it is um, because you know we we, we also want to make sure that we're being efficient with 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 our money as well. Because you know, one thing we find as we go out to eat, um, healthier food options are a little bit more expensive. You know, and and who doesn't want to save a buck? Who doesn't want to you know put back a little bit? So there comes comes that challenge of okay, do we spend thirty bucks here and, and you know add salmon and, and asparagus, or do we you know swing through one of one of our favorite restaurants? I won't name names, and and do we get a value meal? And you know. We'll get the Coke Zero, uh, but you know, do we do we get the value meal and, and save some money there? Um, because that that's always that part of it is always an option because we know there's always going to be access to uh, something quick and something easy and something a little bit less expensive. And if she tempts me, I'm going to fall for it. And if I tempt her, a lot of times she falls for it. It's just you know, it's just one of those challenges because we both love waffle fries and you know, Polynesian sauce and so on and so forth. <laughs> but uh, that, that's, that, that access piece and that cost piece is huge for us and as, as it is for a lot of people, especially with the work that we do out in the community. Uh, a lot of people that we serve, um, you know, income is a, is a big part of their, their daily life struggle. So if it's a question of eating something healthy versus not eating at all, you know, nine times out of ten we find that the people we serve are going to eat whatever they can get their hands on or whatever they can afford. And, you know, who's, who blames them for that, right? So uh, the cost piece of it for me personally um, is a big deal because my wife tells me I'm cheap all the time. So if I can save a dollar, yeah, I'm going to do that. You know, we'll, we'll, we'll try our best to eat healthy you know, on that budget, but if it's going to break the budget, then I'm probably going to be the one that says, oh, let's, you know, let's just grab, just grab something quick, you know, something quick and easy. And most of the time, that's going to mean something, you know, that's going to be higher and added sugar, that's going to be less healthy, so to speak. Um, but again, we fight on and, and we, we continue to, you know, I've been a personal trainer for about 20 years, and one of the things I always told my clients, you know, they beat themselves up when they kind of fall off, so to speak. And I would always try to remind them that, you know, you got to give yourself some grace. And falling off is okay. It's a part of the journey. It's just a matter of remembering to get back on track. You know, fall off, and, but get back on track. And that's, you know, we try to live by that same mantra as well because, you know, there's a lot of love connected to food. There's a lot of good things connected to uh that, but so you know everything in moderation, and we try to remind ourselves of that, and make sure that we are um, putting our best foot forward, so to speak, when it comes to consuming 
healthier foods and, um, you know, living healthier lifestyles. But we do make sure that we treat ourselves um, from time to time. So those are, uh, that's our struggle, <laughs> you know, um, and it is a struggle indeed along with, you know, the people that we serve, you know, for them, the access piece is huge. Um, and then there's the piece, even if I have access, even if I have um, the means to afford healthier living or, or consuming healthier foods, do I even know what that looks like? Um, again, I've been personal training for a while, um, but it wasn't until my wife suffered a heart attack that we really dug into this thing as far as what does that look like. When we go to the grocery store and we're picking up these foods, how do we know we're picking up something healthy versus something uh, not so healthy? And that's where, you know, the information and the education and, and understanding what it is we're consuming uh, becomes important. You know, we used to frown or kind of look at people weird when we see them in the store reading the back of the cans or reading the back of the packaging and those type of things. But now we get it. You know, it, it's intentionality and, and understanding what all this stuff on the back of these labels mean. What is the serving? If something tells me, okay, 10 grams of added sugar per serving, well, if I think the serving is that entire bag or entire can versus uh, one cup or two tablespoons, so on and so forth, then my misinformation is, is to my detriment. So we had to really start looking at labels and, and doing research and doing homework and, and educating ourselves on what a carbohydrate may be or, or you know, what has this amount of protein or this amount of added sugar, you know, what's the difference between added and natural sugars? So we had to do a little bit of homework and a little bit of research to better equip ourselves as we go into the stores to purchase food to make sure that we're purchasing the best options, you know, the best options from a uh, nutritional standpoint as well as the best option from an economic standpoint as well. But we had to do some work. You know, and, and that's still a work in progress. <laughs> uh, my wife and I, you would think we're in math class or something sometimes because she's like, babe, what, you know, what's a gram? Or why can't they just put a spoon next to it to let me know that it's a tablespoon or a teaspoon? I don't know what this stuff looks like. So, there's, you know, you get frustrated, but it, it needs to be done. It, it's one of those things that you have to do from, for the sake of living healthier and living uh a lifestyle that's going to make sure that you are you're healthy and, and here and well. It's you know sometimes it's a matter of doing things you don't want to do. You know, a lot of times it's about doing things you don't want to do. Uh, a little bit of extra reading, a little bit of extra uh, choosing, a little bit of um, intentionality as far as what are we going to eat. A little bit of pre-planning goes a long way. Uh, we're still trying to figure that whole meal prep thing out. You know, we'll we'll do it for a week, and and then, and then who knows? We look up and we've eaten out, you know, four times in a row. So there's so many struggles, so many personal struggles, um, because we work. You know, we live in a society where, you know, it, it's pretty rare in our culture where you have uh, someone staying at home. You know, you usually got two two parents or, or two people who are working. So when it comes to preparing meals and who's in charge of, of feeding uh, the house that day, you kind of, you know, I'm looking at her, she's looking at me. Is it my turn? Is it your turn? Because, you know, the, the day has its, its own wear and tear on you. And the last thing a lot of times you want to do is try to figure out, okay, what are we going to eat? And what does that look like from a health standpoint? So, um, Again, you find yourself grabbing whatever is easy, whatever is convenient, whatever is there. And there's a lot of that stuff always readily available for you to just reach out and grab. And, and, and like a lot of people, we're guilty of that as well. Um, you know, I, I'll be the first to admit we're, we're guilty of that as well, trying to balance that 
lifestyle obligations, responsibilities with, oh, yeah, by the way, we need to go to the store. We don't have any vegetables. So we're out of brown rice. And all we got is white rice. Or, hey, we got some cold cuts in there. You want to do sandwiches? Oh, we don't have any wheat bread. But we got white bread. You know, we got honey wheat. So, so you find yourself uh, teetering on, okay, today was a long day. Today was a busy day. I had meeting after meeting. I had to go serve. Oh, yeah, but now I have to eat. I have to feed myself. And what's available for me right now? Because I just want to take my shoes off and, you know, rub my feet together sitting on the sofa. So if there's not something readily available that's going to be a, a healthy option, who's really in that headspace? I'm trying to – I just want to eat because I'm ready to wind down. And, and that's, that's a big part of it. That's a big part of it. And that's a – even going back to the work that we do, a lot of that's a lot of the um, conversations that people have with us. It's it's a lifestyle thing. Like I just don't have the time. Or um, at the end of the day, the last thing I want to do is worry about finding something healthy to eat. I'm just ready to to shut my day down. I'm just ready to eat because I one I know I need to eat. I haven't eaten all day. Or two. I'm starving, and I don't want to have to prepare something. I don't, I don't want to go through that at this point. I'm already hungry. I'm ready to eat and call it a day. So there's several different things that, you know, I struggle with, my wife struggles with, uh, extended family members struggle with, because we all have pretty similar lifestyles. Um, we all have those same cultural connections to food and fellowship. We all have those uh cost versus reward conversations within ourselves and within our household. And then there's the access, you know, depending on where you live. Is it easy for me to get where I need to go to get something that's healthier? Are there healthy options within a reasonable uh, radius of where I live? So, you know, these are constant struggles that I have, my wife has, um, and, and the people that we serve on our mobile unit. Like we, we all have the same conversations, which, you know, <clears throat> it's great that we can have those conversations and those connections because it allows us to better serve, but it doesn't negate the fact that these are all still challenges that we got to try to figure out a way to uh, counter and get over and get past for the sake of uh, better living. Thank you for sharing your story and encouraging others to reduce added sugars consumption and make healthier choices. Next, we have Dr. Shu Wen Ng, professor at the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill, Gilling School of Global Public Health Department of Nutrition, to discuss sugar reduction policies around the world. Dr. Ng, the floor is yours. Hello, thank you for the opportunity for me to share some of the global evidence and lessons on sugar reduction policies. I want to start by first stating that I've not received funding from the packaged food or beverage industry or the alcohol, tobacco, pharmaceutical, or fossil fuel industries. The work I'm about to present reflects the enormous and multi-year efforts by a large group of researchers from across the globe, including but not limited to those shown here, who are members and collaborators of the Global Food Research Program. Collectively, we have received funding from the Bloomberg Philanthropies, the International Development Research Center, the Chilean Science and Technology Institutes, and the US NIH to contribute to the assessment of several sugar reduction po related policies in many countries. And indeed, there are many policy options to reduce sugar that government bodies should consider, many of which can be integrated with each other. I'm going to start with discussing fiscal options and build further from that. Here is a map of sugary drink taxes across the globe, which is a policy option that has had more traction, particularly in the past nine years, ever since Mexico implemented the first meaningful excise tax and sugary drinks in 2014. Excise taxes are different from sales taxes in that they are levied on and collected from manufacturers and or distributors 
because the idea is to seek correction for the negative externalities generated by products known to contribute to poor human and or planetary health directly from the source. In Mexico, this was a volume-based design at one peso per liter, which was roughly about a 10% price increase on non-alcoholic beverages with added sugars implemented since 2014. In 2018, South Africa also used a specific excise tax, but sought to set the tax amount based on the sugar density of products with added sugars. In collaborating with partners at the National Institute of Public Health in Mexico, including Dr. Arancha Colchero and Dr. Juan Rivera, we found that Mexico's volumetric tax resulted in a reduction in sugar sweetened beverage purchases across all income groups with larger reductions among the lowest income level, and that these reductions were even larger in the second year since the tax was implemented. Moreover, we found that heavier consumers of sugary drinks who are the subpopulation that would have the largest health burden reduced their uh, SSB purchases the most. This shows that the sugary drink tax in Mexico was progressive for health. South Africa's sugary drink tax called the health promotion levy was also about a 10% price increase at the time of its implementation but it is much lower now due to inflation. In collaboration with researchers at the Witwatersrand University and the University of the Western Cape, led by Drs. Karen Hoffman and Dr. Rena Swart, respectively, we assessed both volume and sugar changes in beverage purchases. We found that the volume of tax beverages purchased fell by 29% and the sugar from tax beverages fell even more suggesting important reformulation responses by the beverage industry in order to lower their tax liability. In addition, consistent with results in Mexico, we found that lower income or lower socioeconomic households had larger reductions compared to higher income households. The United Kingdom also implemented around the same time as South Africa, a sugar density tax during, uh, using a threshold system called the soft drink industry levy. Drinks containing five grams per 100 ml of, or less of sugar were untaxed. Those with five to eight grams of sugar per 100 ml were taxed at 18 pence per liter. And those with more than eight grams of sugar per 100 ml were taxed at 24 pence per liter. The UK uh, National Institutes of Health Research funded a comprehensive and independent evaluation of this levy comprised of researchers from Cambridge, Oxford, and the London School of Tropical Medicine and Hygiene. These researchers found that the purchases of high sugar tiered beverages fell by 44%, while lower sugar tier beverages fell 86% with commensurate sugar reductions. Meanwhile, there were increases in the purchases of the lower sugar tier beverages, resulting in a net reduction in sugar from drinks of about 10%. The team also found that there were reformulations and increases in the presence of non-sugar sweeteners in beverages sold in the UK. Meanwhile, the repeated, cross -section, uh, repeated cross-sectional international food policy study found that UK participants increased their support for taxes and has lower preferences for sugary drinks since the implementation of the tax. Finally, in content analysis, researchers found that beverage industry itself shifted its discussion of the soft drink industry levy from being strongly opposed to noting how this tax encouraged them to adapt and that they were doing their part to support healthy choices among consumers. So to date, we are seeing that a price increase of at least 10% for sugary drinks will already have some impact on sugary drink purchases, and we can expect that larger tax levels would have even bigger effects. So it's not surprising that more and more countries have begun implementing such a tax policy option, with the Gulf states having the largest tax rates to date at 50% on carbonated drinks with added sugars and 100% excise tax on energy drinks. 
It is critical, however, to note that it is the relative prices across sugary versus healthier beverage alternatives, which is what we want to shift um, for to encourage both consumer and supply behavior changes. Meanwhile, other independent and peer-reviewed studies have shown that despite the beverage and sugar industry arguments, there have yet to be proven impacts of sugary drink taxes on national economy or employment. In fact, the World Bank and the International Monetary Fund are actively promoting taxing sugary drinks among the, um, along with alcohol and tobacco as major sin or health taxes. The World Health Organization has also included taxing sugar sweetened beverages as one of its best buy interventions or policies to promote healthier diets. However, there's also a missed opportunity with the regards to the tax revenues. With the exception of some local jurisdictions in the US that have formed community advisory boards tasked with determining the use of revenue generated from such taxes, most national sugary drink tax revenues have not been earmarked. Many argue that this is a missed opportunity for addressing health and social inequities and have recommended that the revenues be redirected towards health promotion, particularly among lower income subpopulations. I've primarily focused on taxes on sugary drinks because drinks are the largest contributor to sugar intake in most countries and in liquid form thus have particularly deleterious impacts on health when consumed in excess. However, taxing non-essential foods that are high in sugar as well as high in other nutrients of concern is also possible and there's some movement in this space as well as shown in this map. Evaluations of these taxes are less common and are more complex given the various nutrients and food categories that are included versus exempted, and there are the larger variability of market structures in different countries. Defining what food items should be taxed has also been challenging. However, the growing evidence on the ill effects of ultra-processed foods and their markers as defined by the NOVA classification potentially operationalized using a combination of nutrient content and ingredients can provide a way forward. One such country that recently passed a tax on ultra processed foods is Colombia, along with a concurrent tax on sugary drinks that just started in November this year, with a higher tax levels uh, with each additional year as shown in this table. As an aside, a single use plastic tax is also being implemented and an octagon front of package labeling warning uh, is also going to be implemented as well. Th so this is a great example of a whole set of coherent policies aimed at discouraging ultra processed products that can contribute to poor human and planetary health. Evaluation of Colombia's policies will, will be happening over the next several years. This is also a nice segue for me to shift about talking about front of pack labeling uh, policies as a way to reduce sugar among other nutrients and ingredients of concern. This map shows the various countries with mandatory front of package labeling regulations to date. Note that in the Americas, the black and white warning approach in particular has taken off. Canada and Brazil are using magnifying glasses, but otherwise many other countries are going with octagon logos. In Mexico, Argentina, and Colombia, there are also either statements or extra warnings if a product contains non-sugar sweeteners and caffeine. You will also see that Chile was the first to implement Octagon logos, and thus it is the country where the evidence is the most advanced. In the next set of slides, I want to share work led by colleagues, including Dr. Camila Carvalan at the University of Chile and Dr. Lindsay smith taley at the University of North Carolina in Chapel Hill, in evaluating the 2012 law on food labeling and advertisement. This law included an integrated set of policies aimed at trying to reduce the supply and demand of ultra processed products using markers such as added ingredients and levels of nutrients of concern, including sugar. Remember that 11 years ago, when this policy, this law came into place, the concept of ultra processed products was still relatively new. So at that time, this was a very innovative set of policies and it was a groundbreaking approach. Importantly, it addressed in a coordinated manner front of package labeling, 
marketing restrictions, and banning of products with Octacon labels in schools. Due to pushback from industry lobby groups, some of the nutrient thresholds levels, such as for sodium, were loosened, and the implementation of these sets of policies were broken into three phases. As such, the resultant thresholds are shown here in this table. These thresholds only apply to packaged foods or beverages that contained added sugars, added sodium, or added saturated fats. Moreover, the energy or caloric thresholds were only applied if a product was identified as being high in sugar or high in saturated fat. This means that roasted nuts without any additives and single ingredient items like honey would not be subject to the labeling regulation. There are also specific requirements on aspects such as the size of the octagon labels. Here's a visual in, uh, in the case of a strawberry flavored yogurt that is high in sugar. Overall, the research team also found very high compliance with the labeling regulation in Chile, which is proof of its implement implementability. In addition to the octagon labels on packaging, the products that had any octagon labels would not be allowed to use child appeals such as licensed or brand characters or free gifts in or on the packaging. In the first phase, these items were also no longer allowed to be advertised on TV programs or websites targeting children under 14, defined as where children make up more than 20% of the audience. During programming when products would be advertised, the products had to include the octagon labels on them as well. In the second phase, the marketing restriction was expanded to be a total ban on TV advertisements from 6 a.m. until 10 p.m. because there was also recognition that children were still getting exposed to marketing of high-end products via other forms of non-child-directed programs. Evaluations of the resultant changes in children's exposure to high-end products via TV advertising was done by Teresa Correa and Dr. Francesca Dillman Carpentier. They found that after the first phase of Chile's law, this fell by 44% among preschoolers and 58% among adolescents, including reductions in child-directed strategies. There is currently a gap in evaluation of marketing via newer forms of media, particularly digital marketing, which is an area that future evaluations of similar policies in other countries like Argentina will be doing. With regards to marketing on packaging itself, there were also uh, some visible changes. Here you see, for example, that Tony the Tiger uh, has been removed when you compare the 2015 to the 2017 packages available in the market. Work done by Dr. Fernanda Mediano showed that there was a large reduction in the proportion of high-end ready-to-eat cereals that used child-directed marketing between 2015 and 2017, a year after the implementation of the law. In contrast to this, cereals that did not classify as high-end increased their use of child-directed marketing during the same period from 8% to 30%. Importantly, most Chileans seem to understand that the, the octagon warning labels, despite only a very short period of public education campaign. Both mothers of preschoolers and adolescents had very high understanding that the octagon labels indicated which products were less healthy and that more labels indicate that a product is less healthy than fewer or no labels. Indeed, even children were able to easily understand the labels. In qualitative focus groups conducted by Teresa Correa, it was found that low-income mothers used and understood the labels and that children were informing their caregivers about the fact that products with octagon labels were no longer allowed in schools and that, and that uh, children were requesting healthier options, as shown here in these quotes, which I'll give you a moment to read. Indeed, with the school restrictions, work by Camila Masri found the prevalence of foods with labels fell dramatically 
from 90% to 15% within the first six months of the phase one. In addition, research by Dr. Gabriela Freites looking at foods and beverages consumed by preschoolers and adolescents while they were in school found that these were lower in the, uh, these were lower in the targeted nutrients. Here we see that sugar intakes fell by four and a half percentage points in 2018, and then further by nearly 12 percentage points in 2019 compared to 2016. New work that is currently under review, led by Dr. Lindsay Smith Taylor, shows that purchase changes across the pre policy periods into phase two, as in indicated by the red vertical lines, uh, with the black, dark blue lines be showing the observed trends versus the dotted blue lines um, showing the counterfactual scenarios of what would have happened in the presence of the Chilean laws. So in comparing these observed purchases to the counterfactual scenarios, we see significant decreases in the purchases of labeled foods and beverages during phase two. This includes a 23% relative reduction in energy, a 37% reduction in sugar, a 16% reduction in saturated fat, and a 22% reduction in sodium. These decreases in labeled food and beverage purchases were partially compensated by increases in the purchases of products without labels. However, the net effect shows a significant decrease in total nutrients purchased both during phase one and phase two of the regulation. Besides shifts in consumer preferences, one major factor has also been that the combined policies encourage manufacturers to reduce sugar, sodium, and saturated fats in their products. Work done by Dr. Marcela Reyes found that there were meaningful sugar reductions in these food groups in particular. Moreover, in the first phase of the law, the proportion of products that very high, had any high in labels fell from 51% to 44%. Not surprisingly, the reductions were often just below the nutrient thresholds. Alongside documented reductions in sugar, the experience in Chile also showed increases in the presence of non-sugar or non-nutritive sweeteners in products available for sale and in purchases from work conducted by Dr. Camila Zanjeta and Dr. Natalia Rebelliado. Importantly, Chile is a country that requires that the amount of each type of non-sugar sweetener to, to also be listed in the nutrition label. As such, it is possible to not only study the presence of non-sugar sweeteners, but also the amounts of every type of non-sugar sweetener um, that are in products over time. It is then also possible to assess whether the sweetness of products changed since the law. Dr. Rebelliero's work showed that while there were reduction in sweetness coming from sugar, there were increases in sweetness coming from non-sugar sweeteners, such that there were no net change in the sweetness of products purchased by Chilean households after the law was implemented. So although replacing added sugar with non-sugar sweeteners reduces sugar and calories, the sweetness of the product was maintained. Sweetness increases product palatability, which is a well-documented driver of food purchases and energy intake. Meanwhile, products containing non-sugar sweeteners often also contain excessive amounts of nutrients of public health concern and other additives like preservatives and colorings. In addition, activation of sweet taste receptors throughout the body may contribute to the effects of non-sugar sweeteners on metabolic outcomes, such as glucose intolerance and insulin resistance. There are also many different types of non-sugar sweeteners in the food supply now, and how each of these sweeteners may be associated with longer term health outcomes is an area that still need further research. In light of such gaps in the scientific literature, it would be important to have a way in which to monitor consumers exposure to the various types of non sugar sweeteners, not just the types, but also the amounts of each of them. Researchers have in Chile have and will be able to do this but data from more countries are also needed.
On, lar on the larger macroeconomic impacts of Chile's integrated law, work by Dr. Guillermo Baraje found no change in employment, wages, or profits since the law's implementation. Even the food industry began to embrace the law, citing that it has encouraged innovation and entrepreneurship. So to summarize the Chilean experience, we can see how the multi-pronged policy using a strong nutrient and ingredient profiling model to identify packaged foods and drinks with added sugar, added sodium, and or added saturated fats that are high in these nutrients of concern can work in concert. The law also provides scaffolding for future policies, including the potential expansion of the restrictions of products with the labels beyond school settings, and a tax regime based on the labels with potential targeted use of the resultant revenue. Together, it provides a coherent and consistent message to manufacturers and retailers, as well as to consumers. I also want to speak about innovative improvements to Brazil's national school feeding program that have the potential for sugar reduction, as well as sodium uh, and overall ultra processed food and drink reduction. The um, program called PINE um, is one of the largest child feeding programs in the world, providing 44 billion student meals each year. The evaluation of the modified guidelines are underway, um, but these policies included improved, um, these improved policies included the financial restrictions around the acquisition of ultra processed foods and floors on the use of funds for fresh or minimally processed foods. There were also additional caps on the frequency of having ultra-processed foods in school menus and bans on added sugars and non-sugar sweeteners in prepared foods and drinks for children under three years old. Before I wrap up, I also want to point to evidence that has grown over the years about the limits and sometimes counterproductive efforts of industries self-regulation or voluntary pledges. Here are only three specific examples, but more can be found at the UNC's Global Food Research Program's resource page online. Evaluations of Canada's voluntary marketing nutrition pledge found that while nearly 80% of TV ads from participating companies complied with industry set nutrition criteria, these would have been categorized as less healthy by the UK government's nutrient profiling model, and that all of them featured products deemed excessive in either sodium, free sugars, or saturated or trans fats, according to the Pan American uh, Health Organization's nutrient profiling model. In Australia's 2009 Responsible Children's Marketing Initiative and Quick Service Restaurant Initiative, TV food advertisement in 2011 versus 2015 found virtually no change in ad advertising rates for both unhealthy groceries and fast foods. And then in the U UK's 2011 public health responsibility deal, this saw participating companies making pledges in changes that were largely already underway and would not impact their sales, add a little value in terms of improving the food supply and in the case of sodium, displaced a functioning initiative to the detriment of the population's health. Together, the evidence shows that compared to public health recommendations, industry self-regulations are insufficient in scope and coverage, use weak nutritional criteria, and lack enforcement and penalties strong enough to ensure compliance. Moreover, industry groups and companies benefit from self-regulation as a public relations tool and as a means to avoid mandatory regulations. So to summarize, I hope it is clear that regulations and legislations are necessary. Moreover, there is a need to go beyond standalone policies. Integrated and coherent policies working together are critical and can result in measurable and meaningful impacts. There is also a need to go beyond focusing only on sugar alone and begin measuring the spillover implications on sweetness of products given reformulations. It will be a better long-term strategy to focus on lowering sweetness of products instead of only focusing on sugar. 
Finally, while policies to discourage the availability and consumption of unhealthy foods are necessary, there is also a need to encourage the supply and demand of healthy, minimally processed or unprocessed foods and drinks. Fiscal, labeling and marketing policies and regulations of the food environment in schools and other public spaces are all critical and necessary policies that should work in concert towards sweetness reduction. I welcome you to use and refer to resources available on the Global Food Research Program's website, which pulls together global peer-reviewed, independent, and conflicts of interest-free evidence on many of the policy options I've presented today. Finally, I want to end by again acknowledging the collective effort involved in helping grow the global evidence base around sugar reduction policy efforts of which the Global Food Research Program team is just one contributing member. There's still more work to be done and careful evaluation of policies globally are underway as we continue to learn from and improve upon policies. Again, thank you for your attention and the opportunity to share some of the global evidence and lessons on sugar reduction to date. Thank you, Dr. Ng, for providing an overview of global sugar reduction policies and lessons learned. Next, I'd like to turn the program over to Ms. Amaka Anekwe, Director of Strategic Nutrition Initiatives at the New York City Department of Health and Mental Hygiene to talk about New York City's National Salt and Sugar Reduction Initiative. Hello all, my name is Amaka Anekwe and I am the Director of Strategic Nutrition Initiatives at the New York City Health Department. I am pleased to join you today to discuss the added sugars reduction work of the National Salt and Sugar Reduction Initiative, or NSSRI, an initiative led by the New York City Health Department. Here's the agenda I will be walking through today. First, I'll provide some background on the NSSRI, including our previous work on sodium reduction. Then I'll go into detail about our added sugars target. And finally, I'll discuss how we measure impact of the targets and our next steps in this initiative. The NSSRI began as the National Salt Reduction Initiative, and in order to understand our most recent work on sugar reduction, it's helpful to first talk about our prior work on sodium, as it laid the groundwork for where we are today. Modeled off of Public Health England's salt reduction targets, the NSRI launched in 2009, focusing on national sodium reduction in the food supply. Because high sodium intake can increase blood pressure and risk of heart disease and stroke, and because we know Americans are consuming far too much sodium in one day, the goal of NSRI was to reduce sodium in packaged and restaurant food in order to reduce risk of heart disease and stroke. The top sources of sodium in the diet were and still are packaged and processed foods. And dietary sodium is found in a variety of these types of products. This suggests that there was great opportunity for industry to make small changes across a variety of product categories that could have an enormous impact on population level sodium intake. As part of NSRI, the New York City Health Department convened a partnership of organizations from across the country who together asked the industry to voluntarily commit to sodium reduction in their products. Our partners consisted of city and state health authorities, health organizations, and associations from across the country who came together through the NSRI national partnership to make this joint ask of industry. This partnership still thrives today as part of our expanded sugar reduction efforts. Through a robust engagement process, which included receiving and considering industry feedback, we set sodium reduction targets for 62 packaged food categories and 25 restaurant categories for 2012 and 2014. A total of 28 companies committed to reduce sodium as part of the NSRI. We tracked sodium in the food supply over time by creating and updating up databases with the most recent nutrition information for packaged and restaurant food. This has allowed us to not only analyze the progress of companies that committed to NSRI targets, but also track industry progress as a whole and by category, including companies that haven't committed. We found that from 2009 to 2014, sodium density declined significantly in almost half of all food categories. And overall, sodium density declined significantly by 6.8%. 
From the NSRI, we learned that the model works and innovation is possible in the industry. Our work on sodium reduction targets helped inform the FDA's short-term sodium guidance. After the FDA released draft sodium guidance in 2016, we, the Health Department, in 2018, expanded the National Salt Reduction Initiative to become the National Salt and Sugar Reduction Initiative, or NSSRI, to focus on sugar in the food supply using a very similar framework to that we used for our sodium reduction work. We spent the following years, with the pause for New York City's COVID-19 response, developing sugar reduction targets, which again included gathering feedback from industry. In February of 2021, we released our sugar reduction targets. Similar to sodium, most of the sugar that Americans eat and drink also comes from prepared and packaged foods, not from sugar added while cooking or baking. And nearly 70% of packaged foods and beverages purchased in the U.S. contain caloric sweeteners. We also know that adults and children consume more added sugars than recommended, and that intake of added sugars is associated with negative health outcomes. The average intake of added sugars is 266 calories per day compared to the recommendation of a limit of 200 calories for a 2,000 calorie diet. The graphic on the right shows the different sources of added sugar in the diet, which include a range of processed foods like sugar-sweetened beverages, snacks, and sweets, as well as some rather unexpected sources like salad dressing and barbecue sauce. While we like we saw with sodium, sugar is ubiquitous in our food supply, again, emphasizing the significant role that industry has in shaping diets. Small changes across a variety of food categories can have a large impact. This graph shows the steps we took to develop the NSSRI sugar reduction targets, which again, were modeled after our work on sodium. Our first step was to build a database to assess sugar levels in the food supply at baseline. We created, a preliminary, we created preliminary targets for 13 categories of foods and beverages that contribute most to added sugar intake, and released these targets for industry feedback via a comments period in the fall of 2018. We updated our categories and targets in response to the comments we received and released revised targets covering 15 categories for a second and final comment period in the summer of 2019. I'll give an example of the types of revisions we made when we look at the targets in just a moment. Updated targets, taking into account both rounds of feedback, were released in February 2021. We'll be analyzing data on the food supply this year, 2023, and in 2026 to track progress towards these targets over time. As I mentioned on the previous slide, the first step in setting the targets was to build a packaged food and beverage database. We did this by merging meals and sales data and label insights nutrition data, which essentially contains all of the data on the nutrition fact label linked by Universal Product Code, or UPC. Packaged food and beverage categories were established by considering the foods and beverages that contribute most to added sugars that intake in the diet, food categories commonly used by regulatory agencies and industry, similarities between products, opportunities for technical challenges, opportunities and technical challenges for sugar reduction, and feedback from the food and beverage industry. Only products with added sugars are included in the initiative, so the database excludes products without added sugars. We included the top selling products in each category, which accounted for the top 80% of sales volume. We calculated the mean sugar density for each category weighted by sales volume. We did this so that the products purchased and consumed more often factor more heavily into the average sugar baseline level for each category. We calculated the baseline for each category using 2017 data, and targets were set as a percent reduction from that baseline. We released draft categories and targets, which kicked off a two-year process to refine both by soliciting feedback from industry. In the end, we landed on 15 categories of foods and beverages, which we'll take a look at shortly. These categories altogether represent about 60% of sugar intake in the diet. Of note, added sugar's content was not yet available on the nutrition facts label when NSSRI targets were set. And so NSSRI targets are based on total sugar. In most categories, the total sugar content is equivalent to the amount of added sugars because the vast majority of food products do not contain naturally occurring sugars, with the exception of dairy products and categories, where some of the total sugars come from naturally occurring lactose. 
in response to comments, we developed a way to account for these natural sugars in these products. And this is a similar approach that was taken by the UK in the development of their sugar reduction target. For products where dairy milk is the first ingredient, we provided a 4 gram per 100 gram sugar allowance and a 2 gram by 100 gram allowance for products where dairy milk is the second ingredient. There are a total of 15 NSSRI categories listed on the right, which stem from seven meta categories seen on the left. Drinks, grain-based desserts and snack bars, refrigerated and frozen desserts, candies, breakfast cereals, condiments and toppings, and yogurt. As mentioned, we made revisions to get to these final 15 categories based on industry feedback. Changes from this feedback include the addition of two categories by splitting dairy into two, um, and the two categories were sweetened milk and sweetened milk substitutes, and by adding a granola bar category as a distinct grain-based dessert category. As mentioned previously, our final voluntary targets were released in February 2021. The metric for the targets is sugar density. This means we're looking at the grams of sugar per 100 gram of product or per 100 milliliters for beverages. It is worth pointing out that changing package or portion size does not impact density since the ratio of sugar to amount of product does remain the same as size goes up or down. We chose sugar density as the metric to help drive reformulation. An SSRI will evaluate industry progress towards sales weighted mean targets by using our proprietary NSSRI package food and beverage database to calculate the average sugar density for each category of products with a sugar target. Again, we'll assess progress for the years of 2023 and 2026. An SSRI added sugar targets come in two forms. First, there's a sales lead of being for total sugar density, that is grams of sugar per 100 grams of food or per 100 milliliters of liquid. This is assigned for each category. The goal is for the sales weighted mean for each category to be at or below the target by the end of each target year. This slide illustrates how the sales weighted mean target works using data from a sample category. In this chart, the sugar density is along the x-axis and the percent market share of each level of sugar density is on the y-axis. In this particular distribution, each column represents a range of sugar density and the market share of each and the market share of the products that fall in each range. For example, the products in this category that have a sugar density of 30 to 35 grams of sugar per 100 grams together makes up about 25% of the category's total sales volume. In this graph, the current sales weighted mean is where the peak of the black bell curve sits at the 33.1 grams of sugar per 100 grams of food mark. The 2023 target, which again re would represent a 10% reduction, is represented by the dashed red curve, which is at 29.8 grams. And the 2026 target, which represents a 20% reduction, and you can see that the solid red line, is 26.5 grams. If industry were to respond by meeting the target for their products in this category, the overall distribution shifts to the left, decreasing sugar density across the whole category. As a result, the sales weighted mean for the category will also shift to the left. Now, this doesn't necessarily mean that every product has to or even will fall below the sales weighted mean. Some may be below and some may be above, and that's fine, but we're looking to shift the mean of the category. And we'll talk about ways industry can do this in a couple minutes. Mm -hmm. Next, I'll turn to NSSRI guidance maximums, which are suggested upper limits for sugar density of individual products in each category that we set and encourage companies to meet. Guidance maximums represent an additional strategy for sugar reduction, with the expectation that outliers with the highest sugar densities within product categories would be either reformulated or discontinued. While a sales weighted mean targets apply to an entire category of products, the guidance maximums apply to individual products. There are interim 2023 targets and final 2026 targets. For most categories, targets are set to be a 10% reduction by 2023 and a 20% reduction by 2026. For sugary drinks, however, uh, the 2026 target is a 40% reduction, given that uh, these drinks are the top contributor to added sugar consumption. 
This slide illustrates how the guidance maximums work using data from the same sample category we saw on the previous slide. Again, we have a distribution of sugar density, which shows on the far right the products on the market with the highest sugar density, which is 60 grams of sugar per 100 grams of product. In this example, the 80th percentile, or the 2023 max, is, 20, is 39.3 grams, and the 60th percentile, the 2026 target, is 33.8 grams. If industry responds by meeting the guidance maximum, the tail of this curve all the way on the right, which represents the products with the highest sugar density would be removed. Companies meet the target by calculating the mean sugar density of all their products in a category, taking sales into account. Within this model, there are multiple ways that a company could go about meeting the added sugars target in a particular category. For example, they could reformulate to lower the sugar in their products. They could remove sugar-dense products from the market. They could introduce newer, lower sugar products, and or they could shift their portfolio of sales via marketing to influence the sales weighted mean. Unlike with our sodium reduction targets, we did not have any companies publicly commit to the added sugars reduction targets. So as you can see, companies do have flexibility to use a number of approaches to reduce the added sugar in their products. A note on the reformulation strategy, <clears throat> particularly around low and no calorie sweeteners. Targets were drafted with the expectation that companies will meet the proposed targets without increasing saturated fat, calories, sodium, or refined carbohydrates as part of the reformulation to reduce sugar. We advise companies to consider existing and new scientific research and regulations to determine the appropriate use of low and no calorie sweeteners and recommend avoiding use of low and no calorie sweeteners in products marketed to or commonly consumed by children. Since the targets were released, we have published a couple of papers with academic partners that have looked at the potential impact if companies were to meet the targets. The first analyzed daily calories from added sugar for foods and beverages in NSSRI categories and found that if the industry met these targets, U.S. children and youth would consume 7% by 2023 targets and 21% by 2026 targets less added sugar. The second paper is a micro simulation study that evaluated the population level health impact if the NSSRI added sugars targets were met. The study found that achieving the targets would prevent nearly 2.5 million cardiovascular disease events, nearly half a million cardiovascular disease deaths, and 0.75 million diabetes cases with a 6.67 million gain in quality adjusted life years. Lastly, the paper also found that nearly $160 billion in net costs would be saved over a lifetime from a societal perspective. Next year, we will begin to rebuild our database to assess progress in sugar reduction against our 2023 targets. This involves rebuilding the NSSRI database to analyze sugar in the food supply. We will disseminate those results and continue to explore ways to engage with the industry, the public, and government to meet targets and reduce added sugars consumption, as well as explore other research opportunities using the database we build. The information we shared today and more details about the targets and our next steps can be found on the NSSRI webpage, which we encourage people to check out by using the website or QR code seen here. Thank you all again for the opportunity to speak today and share the work of the NSSRI. We are encouraged by the progress on this issue as demonstrated by this public meeting. Thank you so much for your presentation, Ms. Inikwe. We will now take a break until 1.15. When we return from the break, we will begin our series of panel sessions, starting with a government perspective panel on current strategies for reducing added sugars. See you back at 1.15 p.m. Eastern Time.
Welcome to our Strategies to Reduce Added Sugars Consumption in the United States. I'm Mike Kaczynski, and I will be your uh, co-host, uh, along with my colleague, Lieutenant Commander Janisha Robbs. Uh, this is a live virtual meeting. Please note, if we do run into any technical difficulties, we may take a brief unexpected break. But barring any of that, we hope today's event will go seamless. I will now turn it over to my colleague, Janisha Robbs, who will kick this event off. Thank you, Michael. Our next set of panels will feature experts to discuss various strategies and approaches to added sugars reduction. As I mentioned mm -hmm. earlier, we received several questions during the registration process, and those mm -hmm. questions have been shared with today's panelists and incorporated into today's presentation. If you have any additional questions, please send them to sysan-coms at fda.hhs.gov. We also encourage you to submit comments to the docket by January 22nd, 2024. Up next, we have a panel of experts to discuss current strategies for reducing added sugars from a government perspective. I will now turn the call over to panel moderator, Tina Namian, Director of the School Meals Policy Division at USDA's Food and Nutrition Service. Thank you, Lieutenant Commander Robbs, and good afternoon, everyone. I'm Tina Namian, the Director of School Meals Policy in USDA's Food and Nutrition Service Child Nutrition Program. I'm happy to join today's public meeting to discuss strategies for reducing added sugar consumption across the country, and I'm happy to introduce um, my esteemed panel of um, federal colleagues. So first, we have Dr. Claudine Cavanaugh, the Director of the Office of Nutrition and Food Labeling at the Center for Safety, Food Safety and Applied Nutrition at the Food and Drug Administration. Dr. Ruth Peterson, the Director of, Div of the Division of Nutrition, Physical Activity and Obesity at the National Center for Chronic Disease Prevention and Health Promotion at the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention. Dr. Jennifer Webster Syriac, Deputy Director of the National Institute of Dental and Craniofacial Research at the National Institutes of Health. Anna DeJesus, Nutrition Advisor with the Division of Prevention Science at the Office of Disease Prevention and Health Promotion in the Office of the Assistant Secretary for Health in, at the Department of Health and Human Services. Jackie Haven, the Deputy Administrator of the Center for Nutrition Policy and Promotion within USDA. So that will be our panel today, and I'm going to turn it over first to Dr. Cavanaugh, who's going to kick things off for us. Dr. Cavanaugh? Hi, thank you, Tina. Um, welcome, everyone, today. Um, I want to, as Dr. Captain Patrick outlined earlier today, added sugars is now required on the nutrition facts label and is actually defined in our regulations. Now that added sugars is required on all packaged foods, FDA is incorporating it into some of our other labeling and nutri nutrition initiatives. One example is the work we're doing to update the nutrient content claim healthy. The current definition for healthy does not include added sugars as a nutrient to limit since it was established in 1994. So foods currently labeled as healthy could have high levels of added sugar. Um, last year, we proposed to update the requirement for healthy, and the new definition focuses on food groups as well as nutrients to limit. And those nutrients to limit include added sugars, saturated fat, and sodium. We're working to finalize this rule, and we appreciate all of the feedback we've received from stakeholders, especially around the levels of added sugars, since that is a new requirement. All of that feedback will be considered as we move forward. As part of FDA's nutrition initiatives, we're also exploring a, the development of a standardized science-based front-of-package labeling scheme to help consumers quickly and, and easily identify foods that could help them build a healthy diet. The use of front of pack labeling has risen dramatically around the world. And overall, findings from scientific literature, as well as, US, as, well as um, FDA's own consumer research, has found that F, 
a front of pack rating system can help consumers identify healthy foods, particularly for those consumers that have um, lower nutrition knowledge. Consumers tend to prefer simple, more interpretive front of pack labeling schemes, and the front of pack needs to complement the nutrition facts label. And we actually have on this slide a few examples that we're using in our um, experimental studies. So we're currently conducting additional consumer research to explore the development of front of pack labeling, which is part of our commitment to the national strategy on hunger, nutrition, and health. And as you can see, all of these schemes include added sugars. Finally, we have an array of other nutrition labeling and activities that all include added sugars in some way. Um, for example, we have a draft guidance listed on SIPSAN's priority guidance agenda around added sugars and nutrient content claims. We also have included added sugars in our draft guidance related to dietary guidance statements, which was published in March of this year. Dietary guidance statements provide consumers with information about foods and food groups that can contribute to a nutritious dietary pattern, and we have recommended limits for added sugars not to exceed, and also discuss statements for foods that have higher levels of added sugars. The draft guidance actually includes other nutrients and other information as well, but I'm just focusing today on the added sugars component of the guidance. We also want to make sure that consumers have access to nutrition labeling, included the, including the added sugars um, information, more easily to make healthier choices for themselves and their families, whether they're purchasing um, the food in a brick-and-mortar store where they could actually pick up the product and look at the nutrition facts label, or if they're purchasing their food at online retailers. And in the last several years, um, purchasing your grocery store packaged foods online has risen dramatically. FDA published a request for information in April to obtain current information on the content, format, and accuracy of food label information that's presented to consumers through the online grocery shopping platforms. And we intend to use that information that was submitted um, to improve the consumer access and to have consistent and accurate nutrition information. So basically, the nutrition facts label, which includes added sugars, ingredient information, as well as allergen information for packaged foods sold through e-commerce. So definitely more will be coming on that. And finally, we have several citizens' petitions related to added sugars labeling that we are actively reviewing. As you can see, we have been quite busy with our nutrition initiatives, and added sugars play has been playing a role in many of our priorities, include host, including hosting this public meeting today. Now I'd like to turn it over to Ruth from CDC. Welcome all, and thank you to FTA for having this amazing event. This is a critical public health issue, and good morning or good afternoon, depending on where you are in this virtual environment. It would be lovely to be in person, but we'll try the best here to be together in a virtual environment. Um, I'd like to start by giving CDC's perspective on added sugar, and I'd start with everyone in the audience already knowing, I just had to put the slide in, excess added sugar increased the risk for chronic diseases. So as you all know, added sugars contribute calories to your diet without essential nutrients, and it does increase your risk for obesity and type 2 diabetes, high blood pressure, kidney diseases, non-alcoholic liver disease, tooth decay, and gout. One of the things I really want to reiterate through CDC's perspective is that we know this risk starts early. So early dietary habits have long-lasting impacts, and children who consume sugary drinks during infancy, so that 10 to 12 months of age are more likely to have obesity at age six. I also want to point out that CDC, in, in their work to reduce intake of added sugar, acts on many levels. And this slide shows two of those levels, monitoring, monitoring and surveillance, and also consumer education and engagement. Now, if you attended the session this morning, you heard from Dr. Heidi Blank about some of our monitoring and surveillance, but I put up this map so you could also get the reminder that we're using this data to show where the need is and where we can have impact. 
So let me back up and talk a little bit about what you're going to hear from Janet DeJesus, my colleague, about the Dietary Guidelines for Americans and the Healthy People 2023 goals, where we set those targets for the country to reduce consumption of added sugar. So then CDC uses this as our guiding light. So CDC's nutrition-related monitoring and surveillance are important priorities for us. And the data helps us establish baselines, monitor trends over time, and ensure that future strategies consider the needs of populations. So this gets to the slide and the, the graph of the United States on the left for you, which shows that through collaboration with HRSA and CDC, we've produced this map that shows for the very first time state-level estimates of sugar-sweetened beverage consumption among one to five-year-olds. So as Dr. Blank presented earlier this morning, 57.1% of children age one to five consume a sugar-sweetened beverage at least once during the week. And this map with the darker colors being worse show the state-level estimates for intake very widely. Another level CDC acts on to look at how to reduce added sugars is through this consumer education and engagement category. So on the slide on the right, you can see a website where we have a number of materials that I please um, want you to look at over time and refer to. The first one, get the facts, added sugar, know your limits, focuses on the source, of added sugars in the population, as well as limits and data. The second one, the B Sugar Smart infographic, is a very catchy infographic that shows the types of added sugars, the dietary guidelines for recommendations on sugar intake, and consumption statistics among children and young adults and adults. The Rethink Your Drink is a revived Rethink Your Drink campaign, which is now available in Spanish, and it's been adapted on feedback from not only social media, but also focus interviews. And the last one is very important. The State and Media Health Media Center. This can be used by anybody to reshare, rethink your drink and other state and community sugar ads. So please refer to that for anything you might use in your local area or in your organization. I wanna close by showing you a map of where CDC does their funding across the United States. We fund through three mechanisms to state health departments, the teal states you see there, and then we also have to reach the racial and ethnic approaches to community health and the high obesity program that are designated by the pen points. What's really important about our work across the country is that all of our work has a broader nutrition feel to it. So it's about reducing added sugars, but it's also about improving nutrition across the board. You see the strategies that we use here, again, all of these work towards reducing added sugars, including the implementation of the food service guidelines, working on procurement, working in the early care and education centers, and also working on a new and exciting expansion of the family-centered family healthy weight program. And I'm happy to talk about these later in our panel. But for now, thank you for your time, and I'd like to turn it over to Jennifer. Thank you, Ruth. And thank you to the organizers for providing me the opportunity to share why we should think about reducing added sugars from an oral health perspective. One, sugars drive decay, okay? And two, extensive sugar-driven decay can compromise nutritional intake. And finally, sugars drive oral inflammation and oral inflammation versus systemic disease. So first, let's talk about decay. There are oral bacteria that can metabolize sugars to make acids, and these acids break the teeth down. This results in infection, in abscesses, in pain, okay? This is not trivial, okay? Tooth decay is the most prevalent disease in the entire world. Half, more than half of first and second graders here in the U.S. have had caries. And greater than 90% of working age adults in the U.S. have had caries. In terms of disparities, there are high rates of untreated decay in underrepresented minoritized populations here in the U.S. And what about the cost? The estimated global economic burden is $245 billion 
dollars, billion with a B, and it's all preventable, okay? There is direct cause and effect, a clear dose-effect relationship. More sugar means more decay, and again, this is preventable. Now, when there's extensive sugar-driven decay, this can result in broken teeth and lost teeth, and this Poor dentition leaves people unable to have an adequate nutritional intake. Why? Because people are unable to eat fibrous, healthy vegetables, fruits, and meat. And when they try, their experience is painful, and it also results in gastrointestinal challenges. So what do people do instead? They default to softer, sugar-laden, high-carbohydrate foods that happen to be easier to eat, but not good for us, okay? Poorer nutrition. And finally, oral inflammation is worsened by sugar. So what happens with the inflammation? It allows a breach in the epithelium. That's like poking holes. And these breaks or holes allow oral bacteria and other microbes like viruses and fungi, as well as oral inflammatory factors, to leave the mouth and get into the bloodstream, okay? And this has been associated with strokes, Alzheimer's disease, heart disease, poorly controlled diabetes, respiratory infections, osteopenia, rheumatoid arthritis, cancer, and preterm low birth weight. Again, all of this is preventable. What is the cost? The cost is high, both to the individual and to the society. When we have poor oral health because of sugars, this leads to worsened systemic health. It's, it's been well documented that there's decreased academic achievement with tooth pain and toothaches, people missing school. I've also shared with you that people are not able to get an adequate nutritional intake, and because of the cost of dental care, there's increased financial stress. What about the cost to society? Well, we see reduced workforce productivity, there's reduced military readiness, and there's increased health care costs because of emergency care and hospitalization. Sugar is a major driver of these preventable oral conditions. A decrease in free sugars could significantly decrease all, all of these individual and societal costs. Decrease in sugar means better oral health, and this means better overall health. With that, I'll end and hand it to Janet. Thank you. Greetings. Today I will discuss added sugar recommendations from the Dietary Guidelines for Americans. I will start off with a highlight from the Healthy People Initiative. Through Healthy People 2030, the Office of Disease Prevention and Health Promotion works with federal experts to identify public health priorities and to set and track the progress of 10-year national health objectives. Consumption of calories from added sugar is a leading health indicator for ages two years and older. These indicators are a subset of high-priority national objectives that highlight critical public health issues affecting people at different life stages. Moving on to the Dietary Guidelines for Americans, they were highlighted this morning. In brief, they serve as a cornerstone for federal nutrition programs and policies. They are mandated to reflect the preponderance of scientific evidence and are published every five years by HHS and USDA. They are written for a professional audience, including policymakers, healthcare professionals, educators, and federal nutrition program operators. The current Dietary Guidelines for Americans recommendation encourage us to limit added sugars to less than 10% calories per day for ages 2 and older and to avoid added sugar intake for infants and toddlers. 
A top-line recommendation encourages Americans to limit foods and beverages higher in added sugar, saturated fat, sodium, and to limit alcoholic beverages. The Dietary Guidelines Advisory Committee uses systematic review, data analysis, and food pattern modeling to review evidence to support their scientific report that informs the dietary guidelines. Examples of evidence from the 2020 committee is shown here on this slide. The food pattern modeling analysis that was conducted showed that when added sugars in foods and beverages exceed 10% of calories, a healthy dietary pattern within calorie limits is very difficult to achieve. Most Americans have less than 8% of calories available for added sugars, including the added sugars that are inherent in a healthy dietary pattern. Added sugars account on average more than 13% of total calories per day in the United States. The categories of major sources of added sugars are shown on this slide. One strategy to reduce added sugar intake is to lower intake of major sources of added sugars. Specific examples of foods high in added sugars include beverages such as regular soda, sweetened coffee and tea, fruit drinks that are not 100% juice, energy drinks, and flavored milk. Another category includes sweet treats and desserts. In addition, granola bars, flavored yogurt, and many breakfast cereals are major sources of added sugars in the U.S. diet. As I mentioned, it is recommended that infants and toddlers do not consume foods with added sugars. In addition, young children have very little room in their diet um, for added sugars. Consuming beverages with no added sugars is particularly important for children ages two years and eight when they only have a small amount of calories remaining after they consume their nutrient-dense choices. For children and adults, primary beverages should include water or other non-caloric beverages, unflavored milk, or 100% juice in appropriate amounts. Sugar-sweetened beverages are not necessary in our diet, nor are they a component of the USDA dietary pattern. I'd like to highlight a variety of resources on dietaryguidelines.gov for implementation of the dietary guidelines, including figures and graphics, professional presentations, food source lists, and peer review publications. We also have a toolkit for professionals that includes consumer-friendly handouts on reducing added sugars and healthy beverages. The materials take a life stage approach consistent with the guidelines and are also available in English and Spanish. Health professionals can share these handouts with patients, clients, and community partners. And now I'd like to turn it over to Jackie Haven, who will be discussing my plate tools. Thanks so much, Sharon. It's wonderful to join this panel. I'm Jackie Haven, Deputy Administrator for the Food Nutrition Services Center for Nutrition Policy and Promotion. And I'm thrilled today to be talking about how we translate the dietary guidelines that Jana mentioned into actionable steps. So to level set, the dietary guidelines really are the call to action, the what, the federal nutrition policy. And so as we know, the guidelines encourage people to choose foods and beverages, meals that are full of important nutrients. And then we move to uh, MyPlate. And so the MyPlate team actually translates the dietary guidelines into information that folks can use on a daily basis. It hopefully provides inspiration and, multi and many ideas uh, to help encourage busy families uh, to make healthier food choices. So the dietary guidelines are the what, and MyPlate is really the how. And so the dietary guidelines has the expression, make every bite count, and we translate that into start simple with my plate with some simple tips and information to use. So here's some examples of tips and information that are found on myplate.gov. And let me just take a second to say you can find a wealth of resources at myplate.gov. 
along with all of this information, it's embedded in all that we do. So, for example, we have tools and information. We have a shop simple with my plate, start simple with my plate. We've got quizzes, information, information, each of the food groups. So, I highly encourage folks to check out my plate and myplate.gov. So, here are some examples of at tips for added sugars. So Q1, uh, your baby taste preferences are already being formed, so focus on offering your baby a variety of healthy foods with a little salt and added sugar to help set them up for a lifelong healthy eating. And we heard Ruth talk about how things start so young, and so it's really important to get them to follow these tips information. Another tip, little tummies don't have a lot of room and every bite they take should be packed with nutrients their bodies need, and to read the labels for further information. So here's a couple of tips. Again, myplate.gov is chock full of information and tips. Here's a few more from the website. Think about your drink. Uh, balance your meals by drinking water instead of sugary drinks like soda, lemonade, or sports drinks. Try some sparkling water with a lemon wedge or a small piece of uh, fresh fruit. So we've got lots of great tips and information, things that people can do, busy families and individuals. So please check that out. And we also do refer back to the label, which is key for folks finding the sugar in the food products. So check out the label. Compare added sugars on the Nutrition Facts label of similar products. Look at ingredient lists. Uh, there's, many names, there's many names for added sugars, such as fructose, dextrose, and cane sugar. So lots of information there on myplate.gov. So with that, I'm going to turn it back to my colleague from the Food Nutrition Service, Tina Nanyan. Tina? Thank you, Jackie. So um, I'm happy to be here today to talk about school meals and how that fits into the puzzle as we think about strategies for reducing added sugar consumption. Um, at USDA, we really believe that a healthier future starts with children, and school meals are a proven tool for giving children access to the nutrition they need to be healthy and to thrive. Every day, schools provide over 29 million students with lunch and over 15 million with breakfast through the National School Lunch and Breakfast Program. Of the lunches served, about 22 million are provided to children for free or at a reduced price. And recently, a growing number of states have contributed state funds to provide free breakfast and lunch to every student, increasing participation in the school meal program and giving even more children access to healthy school meals. Research shows that for kids that participate in the school meal programs, those meals make up about half of what they eat every school day, and that kids are getting their healthiest meals of the day at school. Students that participate in school meal programs consume more whole grains, milk, fruits, and vegetables during mealtime, and have better overall diet quality than non-participants. Meeting students' nutrition needs also leads to a better learning environment supporting behavioral, behavioral emotional, and mental health and improving academic performance. Federal law requires that nutrition standards for the school lunch and breakfast programs align with the goals of the most recent dietary guidelines for Americans and consider the needs of children who may not have consistent access to healthy, affordable foods and beverages. As you've heard from the other panelists today, the most recent dietary guidelines recommend limiting added sugars to less than 10% of calories per day. Although current school meal standards have weekly calorie limits, there are no specific limits on added sugars. Under the current regulations, schools may choose to serve some menu items and meals that are high in added sugars, provided they meet average weekly calorie limits. Research shows that about 70 to 80 percent of school-aged children exceed the dietary guidelines added sugar rec recommendations. And according to our most recent school meal data, at lunch, the average percentage of calories from added sugars is approximately 11 percent. At breakfast, that jumps to 17%. While the current calorie requirements for the school meal programs are intended to encourage schools to choose nutrient-based foods and or nutrient-dense foods and beverages, with the data on added sugars in mind, USDA determined that the calorie limits alone are not enough to meet recommendations for limiting children's in intake of added sugars, and that specific requirements would be more effective, especially in school breakfast. 
Another consideration for addressing added sugars now was, was FDA's work in the past few years on updating the nutrition facts label. Now that the amount of added sugars in products is clearly stated on the label, it's more reasonable to expect schools to consider this when planning menus. So therefore, earlier this year, USDA proposed updates to school meal standards, including a gradual reduction in the added sugar content of school meals. The USDA proposed a two-step approach to phasing in added sugar limits. The first step would be to provide standards for the leading sources of added sugars in school meals, which include grain-based desserts, breakfast cereals, yogurts, and flavored milk. Step two would be to implement a weekly limit, meaning that schools would be required to ensure that added sugars make up less than 10% of calories in weekly school lunch and breakfast menus. Although the dietary guidelines recommend daily limits on added sugars, the school meal standards, which also include limits on calories, sodium, and saturated fat, are planned around weekly menus. By starting first with limits on specific foods that typically contain significant amounts of added sugar, the intention is to make the overall weekly added sugar limit easier to implement down the road and still provide schools with flexibility in menu planning. USDA received tens of thousands of comments on this proposal, with most supporting one or both of the proposed approaches. Many commenters noted that limiting added sugars in school meals is important for children's health and academic performance, and that product-based limits would incentivize the food industry to reformulate products to help schools meet the weekly limits. Some respondents suggested that product-based limits would be easier and less burdensome for program operators to implement compared to the weekly limits. But other respondents noted that weekly limits align with recommendations from the dietary guidelines and would allow more flexibility for menu planners. As proposed, the added sugar limits for individual products would go into effect beginning in the fall of 2026. The weekly limits would become effective in the fall of 2027. Again, this is a proposed rule, so none of these changes are final until we issue a final rule. And of course, things can always change between a proposed and final rule based on the comments but we expect to issue a final rule sometime in the spring of 2024. And the QR code on this slide has more information about the final rule. So now we're going to move on to the panel discussion. Um, during registration for this event, participants had the opportunity to submit questions and our colleagues at FDA reviewed all those submissions and we're going to discuss a few of them here today. The first question is really for all of us on the panel. How can government agencies collaborate with each other and with health professionals to educate consumers on added sugars? Of course, participating in this public meeting and series of listening sessions is one way our federal agencies are collaborating to address the issue of added sugars. Mm -hmm. And Claudine, as FDA is the host of this meeting, um, I'll start with you and then we can just go through the panel like we did for the presentation. I'm sure, thanks Tina. I agree. I think this public meeting and this panel specifically is really a testament to our collaborative efforts to reducing added sugars. And FDA worked very closely with our federal partners to plan this meeting and also develop the. And I think just by having everybody do their presentations today, you can really see how each agency contributes its own little individual piece to the puzzle to help address added sugars reduction. Um, FDA, we collaborate very extensively with our HHS and USDA partners on many nutrition education work that specifically highlights um, added sugars. And as Captain Fitzpatrick outlined, we have a lot of educational materials on our website but we do know not everybody's coming to the FDA website for their education materials. So we have a lot of materials for health professionals because they really have to amplify all of the messages that we have. And I don't think that's just FDA specific. I think that's specific for all of the federal agencies. So we really try to target um, health professionals. We have continuing education um, hours for doctors and pediatricians to learn more about the nutrition facts label, and that includes added sugars. And we also have lesson plans for teachers that they can use in classes to really target our youngest consumers. And from what everybody presented today, you can see that's an area that a lot of people are targeting because if you kind of start young, hopefully you'll develop really um, helpful um, dietary patterns 
and eating habits. Um, well, we've been targeting really added sugars. I do think a lot of our educational materials, especially from FDA, really do stress the importance of looking at everything on the label and not just totally focusing on added sugars. Because I do think as a nutritionist and a registered dietitian, added sugars is important, but you need to keep some of the other nutrients and um, just dietary food groups um, in mind when you're building a dietary pattern. So um, look at added sugars, but keep that in context with the rest of the nutrition facts label as well. Um, I'll hand it over to uh, Ruth next. Great. Thank you, and thanks for that answer, and thanks for the question. I think it's always funny that people sometimes think agencies don't work together because we all have each other on speed dial through these spider networks. So many different levels of people in the federal government talk to the people in the other agencies at their level. And then I will say the White House Strategy on Hunger, Nutrition, and Health has been a real catalyst in making it also more formal with higher-level people so that all the great work that has been happening, and, and I agree with Claudine, it's not just around the reduction of added sugar, it's around nutrition in general, but all that great work that has been happening, I think, has gotten voice with um, some of the top leadership in the agency. So then we begin to hear it echo down from the top, which is really exciting. As far as providers, I would also agree that we work, again, because we work on the early years and forming those habits early with American Academy of Pediatrics a lot, and we're very involved with, it, with their work when they make um, recommendations to physicians about how to speak with young children and their caregivers and their families. And this is also illustrated in our Family Healthy Weight Program that, as I said, we'd be scaling across the country, where it really is not just telling people to change the way that they eat and drink. It's about changing the environments where those people are living and that every choice they make, we try to make sure as federal agencies that healthy choice is the easy choice in all sorts of circumstances with attention to cultural um, diversity as far as um, ability to obtain um, different food items. So with that, I'll turn it over to Jennifer. Thank you. I think that there may be opportunities for collaboration and joint campaigns um, and to have even other professionals spread the word, like dental, of course, uh, and pediatric dental. Um, could be critical to the health messaging with something like X grams per day, keep A, B, C disease and tooth decay away. I mean, some kind of campaign that across children, their parents, and across professions, um, we can be very effective together. I will pass it on to Ruth. Uh, is that right? I think Dan. I think Dan. Sorry, yeah, Janet. I can go. <laughs> Thanks. Yeah, I'll just say um, every time, like every five years when we update the dietary guidelines, we um, we work with our fellow federal agencies to um, provide information on the new recommendations and share what has changed. I mean, our office in partnership with the CNPP, we also produce a healthcare provider toolkit, but we also stay in touch and communicate so we don't duplicate efforts. Um, our office in CNPP, we have a dietary guidelines review committee, so all materials that are produced in nutrition are reviewed in our two offices to make sure that they're um, consistent with the dietary guidelines. And with that mechanism, we know, like, what's coming, so we try and work on, like, complementary um, activities and materials as opposed to duplicative. Pass it on to Jackie. Thanks. So I echo everything that was said. We work so closely together. I think we are on speed dial. So it's great. And we lift up the thank you, you know, we thank you drink. And, uh, you know, again, I think con consistent messaging across the federal gut family is so important so that consumers hear one message. We're all about trying to improve the health of Americans. And so working together, we really could be much stronger. So thanks for the question. Thank you. Um, and then, then I'll just mention from the child nutrition program's um, perspective, I mean, as I talked about, we are required to base the standards on the dietary guidelines, and so we keep that consistent messaging. And it's um, by aligning with those guidelines on school meals, we're really demonstrating every day to millions of children what a healthy meal looks like. So we think of that also as education, as education about nutrition. Um, 
And then if you heard Administrator Long this morning um, in her remarks, she mentioned that in developing our standards, we collaborated closely with FDA and with other HHS agencies and really relied on their data and um, the evidence that they've, you know, found about all kinds of aspects of nutrition, nutrition not just added sugars. Um, but everything we do, we, we look to the evidence that other, our other federal partners have, have um, developed. Um, we have products that we've worked with CDC on. Um, in the schools, the schools are required to do local wellness policies. And so that's an area where we've worked with CDC. They've helped to develop tools that schools can um, use to think about those policies. So there's a lot of collaboration happening. And then I talked a lot about the reg process for us. And I mean, that's a great way that we get feedback from um, the healthcare providers, from other people who are interested in nutrition. I mean, we got 136,000 comments on that last rule that we published. So, I mean, we look at that as a real collaboration. We did a lot of listening sessions um, with groups. We, we also work closely with the American Association of Pediatrics. Um, so there's a lot of that kind of work doing, going on, and it's, it's necessary, I mean, to do the work that we do. Um, all right. So, um, oh, I also actually wanted to, <laughs> I'm sorry, I don't want to take up all our time on that one question. But that question, I talked a lot about the school meals, um, but from an FNS perspective, I mean, we do a ton of um, nutrition education through WIC, through SNAP. Um, there's a lot of nutrition education going on, and that's all the cornerstone of all of that is really the dietary guidelines. So, again, that consistent messaging coming out of all of the feeding programs, the school programs, the adult programs, um, the programs for, you know, infants. Um, we really rely on that dietary guidelines information and try to make sure, well, we do make sure all of our messaging and all of our education is consistent. All right, so the next question was, what additional data or information would be useful for federal agencies to have to help inform their policies and programs? And I think um, for this question, I'll start with Dr. Peterson. Well, my job at CDC is to always want more data. So I'll, I'm so happy to have this question. Um, you saw the map where we had the map of the sugar sweet beverage intake in the young children. And this is something, and, and getting back to Jennifer's comment about messaging out to specific audiences, this is the kind of data that changes decision maker minds in local areas. So if you're in a red zone where you have the highest intake of sugar sweetened beverages among your young children, you actually do start to think, hmm, I wonder if I should do something about that. So this is what I want more data for. I want more data to show sugar intake among populations um, such as children younger than five, but there's other populations too. I also want to look at setting. So where do children and adolescents get their largest intake? And we know a lot of that from DGA, from the Dietary Guidelines for Americans, but we could also be more specific, and we also would be interested in what time of day those things happen and what influences there are that then you can maybe change the way that you change those influencers. There's a lot of talk about the health impact of non-nutritive -nutri sweeteners, so if, if the if food industry starts to change and reduce sugars, are they doing that with sweeteners? So we also need data about when you reformulate products, what's the impact of those sweeteners on health? And how does that change people's taste and their usage of that? I think consumer knowledge is always, we could always have more information. So even outside the normal regulation and rule call, you know, what do they think about added sugar and what would change their mind and how do we help improve behaviors in a thoughtful, meaningful way that, again, um, takes into account the context in which those people are coming from. And last but not least, um, data as far as how much sugar content is in packaged and processed foods may not be what keeps you up at night, 
But I have to say that when we look at procurement strategies across the country, and when we don't even, we can't even work with local government or people in the community to help them lean into that healthy choice in the foods that they get because they're processed, um, because there's no sugar content labeled sometimes on that, that would be something that would be amazing. So enough of that. That's what CDC wants. So if everybody on the call can just make that happen, that would be just fabulous for me. And I'll turn it back over to Jennifer. Thanks. Yes. Uh, to a point that you made earlier, Ruth, I think understanding in terms of data, understand the relationship between sugar intake and disease burden would be very helpful, and not only to consumers to think about what their intake is, but also to their providers. Yes. Yeah, so I will. I pass it over to Janet. Yeah, I was sure. going to say. Oh, yeah, go ahead. Chime in. Um, I, with what Ruth and Jennifer were both saying, I think now that added sugars, it's only been required on the label since 2021. So it's only been yeah. two years. There were certainly early adopters, but now that it's required on the label, we have a tool that we didn't have previously that we can use to help mm -hmm. monitor the consumption as well as kind of what Ruth was getting at with reformulation. What changes are they lowering it? What are they adding instead? Or are they not adding anything and just producing? So I think that that's really helpful. That can also help us evaluate the impact of some of our policies that we're, we're doing. And particularly, I know FDA is involved in our labeling, as well as I think everybody on, on this call, our education policies, because yeah. some messages and things like that just resonate more with the consumers. And that's been one of the challenges that we've been doing with trying to educate consumers is, you know, how do they understand added sugars and getting that out? Because it is a new thing that they're seeing on the label. So it does take time for them to kind of understand that and process that and put that into the big context. Something that I think FDA is particularly interested in, there's a lot of new sugars out there that are metabolized differently than traditional sugars, and a lot of these are in the pipeline and in development. There are a few um, already out there in products, but just having that information so we can keep abreast of when these new things are coming along and these new technologies that may also be with lowering um, added sugars. So. A lot of industry has been providing us with that, but I think that's something also that's really helpful as well. Janet or Jackie, did you want to add anything? I was just going to give um, a general recommendation. Um, each round, our Dietary Guidelines Advisory Committee has a future direction section of their report where they recommend future research um, that's really needed to fill the gaps in the evidence that they review. And um, just wanted to note that that's a really powerful um, section that I encourage everyone mm -hmm. to um, review because it really helps us in future editions of the guidelines. And I'll just echo, I think Ruth mentioned it, but said a little differently, behavioral research, you know, why we make the choices that we make and how we can influence those moving forward. Thank you. Um, and I mean, all of that sounds great for us, too. Um, one of the things that, and this is kind of, this has been mentioned, but um, one of the primary goals for school meals really is to offer nutritious foods that kids want to eat and really educating them on the right kinds of foods to eat, right? And one of the things that we hear, one of the biggest challenges we hear from schools is that the types of foods that kids are getting at home might be different. And so then they come to school and they aren't necessarily used to those foods. So it would be nice to have more, you know, current and accurate data about like what foods are commonly purchased by households with children. So we kind of know, you know, what the, you know, what they're, what they are seeing at home and, you know, how we can use that information to help, you know, talk with schools about how to work with kids and, and and accept the meals that the schools are offering. Jennifer, you look like you wanted to jump in. Yeah, it's true because this is a multi-level issue, right? We talked about behavior and that's individual, but there's also what's happening at the family level, at the community level in terms of what's available. Um, so I do think as we think about the research of what needs to happen, 
ensuring that approaches is this multi-level approach is, is being um, implemented. Exactly. I think I think the lived experience really gets to what you were talking about, Jennifer, that um, Mr. Robinson talked about today, because he really said that, like, the cultural and family impacts and a lot of things mm -hmm. really impact what mm -hmm. you're eating. And yep. it's just, it's so challenging. So it's more than you just picking out and having that knowledge. There's so much more go that goes into your choices um, and that can have an impact. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. All right, um, so the next question was, how might the recommendations from the 2025 to 2030 Dietary Guidelines for Americans impact the government strategies to reduce added sugar consumption? And um, this was a question that came up a lot, I think, in, in the question that came into FDA. So Janet, maybe you could give us an update on where things stand with the DGA? Sure, I'm happy to. Yeah, currently our um, 2025 Dietary Guidelines Advisory Committee is working. They're reviewing evidence, as I mentioned, systematic review, food pattern modeling, data analysis. So they're looking at quest questions on beverage classes and weight outcomes and also doing some really interesting food pattern um, modeling activities, you know, seeing how, like, less nutrient-dense foods, you know, can fit into the dietary pattern. So, so their scientific work is... Still in progress. Um, we've asked for their report um, next fall around October. So actual development of the next edition doesn't um, begin until we receive their report. Thank you. And then um, Ruth, um, would you have any input on yeah. that? Yeah, definitely. So the thing that concerns me about the Dietary Guidelines for American is that not everyone knows about them. <laughs> so we basically know that it's a, we know it's an incredible document, but it's just such, it's so surprising to me that not everybody knows and not everybody's thinking about it. And they do their day-to-day -day life and their strategic planning. So what we do at CDC is we make sure that we use all of the evidence in the updated DGAs to change the way that we might have communities and states implement strategies to I always say, we know what works. We just have to have more spread and scale of what we know works. We know actually mm -hmm. enough to know how we can communicate better and how we can change individual choice and how we can change the community and how we can change procurement and how we can then, by market pull from procurement, change industry where people do not lose profit. So we know all that. We just have to keep going faster and harder, and the Dietary Guidelines for Americans is the tool that allows us to say, basically, we have cover. This is the science cover. There's really smart people thinking about this. The fact that it's redone mm -hmm. every five years is incredible, and it really doesn't sit on the shelf in our brain. It really gets used day in and day out, and I do think that individual, individual people making decisions are oftentimes shocked when they start to see this great communication coming from all the different agencies that's informed by the Dietary Guidelines for Americans. And even with my plate out of USDA, you don't see sugar as part of my plate. I mean, so these are the kind of things that collectively as agencies we can continue to iterate together, but we couldn't do this without the Dietary Guidelines for Americans. We just really couldn't. Yeah. Thanks. Okay. Uh, Jennifer? I was just going to share, I don't know that people think about that downstream this can make us a healthier country, right? I mean, with our, our challenges, with just so much illness and being the most obese country in the world, uh, and really the sickest, it's these guidelines that implemented widely, to Ruth's point, everyone needs to know about, right? So that individuals and communities uh, that choices can be made so that we can be a healthier country. And I think the White House Strategy on Hunger, Nutrition, and Health incorporated that with a lot of hard work from HHS and other agencies and USDA to get that front and center about the importance of that as a, as a vision. Yeah. And I'll just add that, you know, reduction of sugar has been part of the guidelines, like, since the very, very beginning. I mean, the quantitative recommendation for added sugar started in the 2015 edition but um, historically, there's always been a recommendation on, you know, moderation or reduction of, of sugar intake. Yeah, it's yeah, interesting. We get 
people always ask us, especially during our rulemaking, you know, what if there's a big shift? And I'm like, the guidelines have been around since the 90s. And, you know, there has, has science has certainly evolved and there's been tweaks, but like the main recommendations about getting more fruits and vegetables, not having too much saturated fats or added sugars, that's been consistent over the whole time. So it's, you know, the science, while it does evolve a little bit over time, the tenants, main tenants of the dietary guidelines really have stayed intact um, with what you want to have to build a healthy dietary pattern. I think that the gaps that we have, too, every five years where we see in the science we, there's not enough evidence to recommend X or have a limit on Y. I do think those gaps help all of us as federal agencies because it's one of the reasons that we focused in on doing about 10 publications this year on reducing added sugars and added sugar data. And the map that you saw um, that I just briefly presented, that Heidi Blank presented in much more depth, are just illustrations of, again, how we need to get the information out so that scientists can understand that they can build that into the dietary guidelines, but then we also need to surround sound that with what we get out to communities and decision makers and, and individuals who are making choices every day. So. Yeah, and Claudine, I was going to say basically the same thing you did, that when we do our rulemaking, you know, we often hear that, that, well, why don't you wait until the next dietary guidelines come out and see what they say? But, right, I mean, it's we don't expect any, you know, 180 on what to do with added sugars, right? So, I mean, we keep, we move forward based on what the current dietary guidelines say, and then, of course, we will look at the latest dietary guidelines. That's our statutory mandate. And if there are significant changes in something, we'll address that. But generally, I mean, we wouldn't expect that either. So, all right. Anybody else have anything to add on that? This is going to ask about sugar addiction, right? Um, so for kids who are starting out and they're doing the meal plates and getting it, so that's great. Um, but I do think there's the challenge of people who have incorporated sugars for a long time and helping, pe helping people to know that that's real and what it's going to look like and why it's worth it for them to move past it might be important too. Um, and we haven't talked a lot about that. So I think you're doing an awesome segue into the next panel, Jennifer, because one of the next speakers in the next panel is actually going to be talking about kind of the taste and the sweetness and things like that. So I think that's a great um, segue into our next panel that's going to address that. So um, people need to stay tuned. Right. Great. Well, unless anybody has anything else. Thank you all for participating in this panel. I hope it was helpful. I think it's been really interesting. All right. Thanks, everyone. All right. Thank you. And I want to thank our uh, government panel uh, for discussing strategies on reducing added sugars. We're now going to take roughly around a 10-minute break. Please note there's a QR code on screen if you want to get some additional information on added sugar resources. At this time, we will take break.
All right. Welcome back. Uh, and to the strategies to reduce added sugars consumption in the United States, we're now going to head into our industry panel. I'd like to hand it over to my colleague and counterpart, Jean- uh, uh, Lieutenant Commander Janisha Robb. Janisha, take it away. Thanks, Michael. Up next, we have a panel of experts to discuss industry approaches to added sugars reduction. I will now turn the call over to panel moderator, Dr. Fabiana Mora, nutrition scientist in FDA Center for Food Safety and Applied Nutrition, Office of Nutrition and Food Labeling. Thank you, Lieutenant Commander Robb. Welcome to the industry panel of the FDA Virtual Public Meeting on Strategies to Reduce Added Sugar Consumption in the United States. In this panel, you hear about added sugar reduction from the perspective of the food and beverage industries and restaurants. I will now introduce the panelists for this section in the order that they will present. Dr. Wise, an associate member of the Monell Chemical Census Center. Dr. Alexander, Vice President of Nutrition, Science, and User Experience at Danone, North America. Melanie Condon, Director of Sustainability at Keurig Dr. Pepper, and Errol Fraser, Vice President of Public Policy at the National Restaurant Association. At the end of the presentations, we'll have a Q&A with all panelists. And to start us off and to set the stage for this panel is Dr. Wise, who will present on the current science of sweetness, perception, and whether sweetness exposure may or may not lead to the subsequent preference for sweetness. Dr. Wise, the floor is yours. Thank you very much and for the invitation. Um, again, I'll be discussing some selected topics in sweetness uh, from a perspective of flavor and perception. So before I get going, uh, let me disclose that some of my past and current research funding comes from companies who make sweet foods and beverages. So with that aside, um, I'll start with a basic introduction to anatomy and physiology, making the point that our innate drive to seek rich sources of energy uh, may make sugar reduction an uphill battle from the start. I'll also discuss some differences in processing between sugars and low-calorie sweeteners, uh, potentially relevant to differences in perception. And regarding human perception, you know, we'll see that although sweetness tends to be appetitive, there are individual differences, and many people might be tolerant or even welcome less sweetness. Uh, and last, I'll discuss whether the palate can adjust to a diet lower in sugar and whether replacement of sugars with low-calorie sweeteners might interfere with that process. Okay, so on to some basic nuts and bolts of sweetness perception. For those of the, uh, sorry, uh, so um, like other tastes, sweetness begins when molecules dissolve in saliva and contact specialized receptors on the tongue and palate. Uh, Sugars are sweet, and a common idea is that sweetness evolved to signal the presence of readily available energy from plant sources. It's less clear why myriad other molecules, uh, which provide little or no energy, taste sweet. Why, for example, do stevia plants make various molecules that are sweet? One idea is that plants make compounds to fool animals into spreading their seeds without paying out a sugar bribe. Regardless, perhaps the best argument for sweetness signaling energy for plant-eating animals uh, is that many carnivores have lost the ability to taste sweetness, including our friend the house cat. Uh, this tends to happen when no evolutionary pressure uh, is, uh, is uh, present to maintain a system. You basically lose it or use it, or use it or lose it. For those of us who can taste sweetness, it tends to be attractive and rewarding, as one might expect for species evolved to compete with other plant-eating animals for energy. Preference can be modulated by many factors, but some responses, including the recognizable yummy face uh, in two sweet-loving species shown here, uh, seem to be pretty hardwired. So a drive to to consume sugars may be less adaptive now that sugars are more readily available in modern industrialized societies, but this innate preference is, of course, a challenge uh, to sugar reduction. Moving to anatomy, uh, most of taste comes from the tongue, which is has bumps and protuberances called papillae, uh, the four types of which are named for their shape. Uh, Filiform uh, papillae, or finger-like papillae, uh, uh, do not have uh, taste buds, but they are richly innervated by mechanosensory nerves. 
Um, so these may play a role in the desirable mouthfeel of sugars that most low-calorie sweeters lack. Um, the other papillae contain taste buds, uh, which are rosebud-shaped clusters of about 50 to 100 cells of different types. There are important interactions among the cell types, some of which might be relevant to sweet perception. However, here I'll focus on type 2 or receptor cells, which come in umami, uh, sweet, or bitter-sensitive flavors. On the ends of the receptor cells are finger-like structures which extend out of pores in the tops of taste buds, so they come in direct contact with saliva and molecules in saliva. Zooming in on the, the membranes of these little finger-like structures, there are taste receptor proteins um, for sweet, bitter, and umami. These are G-protein coupled metabotropic receptors, much like receptors for many drugs, hormones, and neurotransmitters. A given taste cell expresses one type of these receptor types, uh, which gives it its particular sensitivity. So binding of taste molecules triggers a cascade of chemical reactions and physiological responses in the cell, which results in signals being carried to the brain by taste nerves. For sweet and umami, the receptors are dimers of three members of the T1R family. So one plus three makes an umami receptor. Two plus three makes the primary sweet receptor, which responds to both sugars and low calorie sweeteners. More recently, it was discovered that many sugars or sweet sensitive cells also express glucose transporters, like those involved in absorption in the gut. So glucose is pulled into taste cells and metabolized into ATP, which in turn affects responses of taste cells. While low calorie sweeteners and sugars both stimulate the primary sweet receptors, glucose and glucose produced enzymatically in the mouth stimulate additional mechanisms. It's unclear whether these transporters play a role in conscious perception of sweetness. One hypothesis that is yet to be fully tested is that transporter pathways may have something to do with differences between sugars and many lower calorie sweeteners in dynamics or how sweetness is experienced over time. It's also possible that they may be sensing calories or be involved in satiety and reward. If so, it may be important to engage these pathways for low-calorie sweeteners to be as satisfying as sugars. Uh, another important difference is that various low-calorie sweeteners also stimulate bitter receptors contributing to undesirable side tastes. One common solution is to use blends of low-calorie sweeteners, ideally those that have synergistic impact on sweet receptors to give good sweetness when each individual sweetener is present below concentrations would stimulate bitter receptors. A classic example of this is uh, the kind of synergy that you see between aspartame and ACE-K. So sweetness is inherently appetitive, which probably served us well when energy was sparse, but poses challenges to sugar reduction now that sugar-rich foods are easy to obtain. I've also introduced the recent discovery of additional sugar-sensing pathways in taste cells, which may be important to engage for an ideal sugar replacement. Um, these glucose transporter pathways may be involved in reward. It's been known for a while that signals from sugars and low-calorie sweeteners can be processed differently in the brain, including areas important for reward. Um, I'm going to leave you with some relevant references here. And though I focused on the mouth, as we heard uh, earlier from Dr. Ng, uh, the mechanisms I discussed are expressed in various parts of the body, including the gut and pancreas. Um, brain responses to sweeteners also depend on what happens after we eat them, uh, which is an area of ongoing research at Monell and other places. So moving on to human sweetness perception, I'll discuss some individual differences in uh, preference evidence regarding whether the palate can adjust to a diet lower in sweetness if the, the sweetness of the food supply can be reduced. First, I'll introduce two common types of sensory measures, uh, intensity uh, or how strong a taste is and hedonic response or how much someone likes a taste. This will be important later on for discussion of studies of acclimation to a low sugar diet. The examples here are for saltiness and pleasantness of chicken broth. Uh, but uh, it works somewhat the same way uh, for salt and sugar. Um, here, uh, the blue curve is intensity, and that tends to increase with concentration. The red curve is liking or hedonic response, uh, and that reaches a happy medium, uh, often called the bliss point, and then tends to decline at higher concentrations. So this tends to be, again, true for sugar, at least for response average across people. But if you look at individuals, for many people, the sweeter uh, something is, the more they like it, and that's the green curve of liking versus sucrose concentration here. Uh, while for others, the sweeter it is, the less they like it, shown in the red curve. 
Uh, some differences in sensory response to sweetness are genetically determined, uh, so people could well be uh, predisposed to respond differently to sugar reduction. There are also differences over the lifespan. Um, kids tend to prefer higher sweetness than adults, uh, and the transition takes place as markers for bone growth decline and energy needs to support growth taper off. Um, sweetness preference, although this is more controversial, it might increase again in the elderly. Taste sensitivity tends, tends to decline somewhat, but smell loss, which shows a bigger decline with age, uh, may be even more important. So most of flavor actually comes from the nose rather than the tongue, and people with smell loss may compensate uh, by going for saltier and sweeter foods. And this issue might be even more broadly important post-COVID, where we have more people of all ages living with smell loss. Um, bottom line, however, um, different age groups might pose different challenges for sugar reduction. Regardless, there are hints that some people might already find many foods and beverages to be too sweet. Application of big data approaches to consumer reviews have shown that complaints about too much sweetness are more common than too little. And further in sensory experiments, sometimes reduced, uh, reducing added sugar from typical levels in foods and beverages is either tolerated or even enhances liking for some people. Now, for example, in a study by Pinelli and colleagues, about two-thirds of subjects found 5.5% added sugar in an orange drink to be ideal, uh, whereas the other third found 10.4% to be ideal. So one caveat is that direct sugar reduction probably won't work as well for products with sub substantial sour and bitter components. Since sweetness tends to mask these other tastes, they can really pop out when the sweetness is reduced. Uh, regardless, there may be room for more products lower in sweetness tailored to different consumer segments. However, raise a question. So would versions of foods and beverages lower in sweetness reduce consumption for people who consume too much sugar or actually encourage more consumption for people who currently avoid sweetened products? Um, that might be worth some more consideration and more research. So moving on uh, to the last topic, I'll discuss evidence regarding whether the palate can adjust to a diet lower in sweetness uh, such that people might come to prefer lower levels of sugar over time. Something like this happens for salt after weeks to a few months on a low sodium diet. Um, of the two sensory measures I introduced earlier, the effect is clearer and more consistent for hedonic response or liking. Uh, for example, in one early study at Monell, after three uh, months on a diet 40% lower in sodium, the bliss point for salt and crackers was cut in half. Many government agencies and health organizations, and we've heard some of this discussion today, uh, assume that something similar will happen for sugar. And, so, and if that's true, you know, simply reducing added sugars in products, perhaps gradually, might be something the population will learn to accept. Um, you'll also frequently see the idea that if sugar is replaced by low-calorie sweeteners, that will keep the food supply sweet and undermine adjustment to low sugar levels and keep people wanting sweets. However, per the summary from a relatively recent systematic review, there's actually very low quality evidence to support either of these assumptions. Um, some short-term studies over days uh, to weeks have found that feeding people up with a particular sweet food can actually decrease liking um, uh, for the food, which is in the opposite direction, or more sweetness leading to reduced preference. Uh, but people might get tired of just, uh, in that case, of the particular food used in the studies uh, which may be a different phenomenon than general adjustment of the palate. Regarding more persistent exposure, one approach is to measure sugar intake, usually via diet records and sweet perception and preference in some individuals, and look for associations. This is cheap and easy, um, so lots of people have done it. And when they do that, uh, they often find that uh, people who eat less sugar tend to perceive sweet, uh, sweeteners as sweeter or prefer lower levels of, of, of sweetener. Some other studies find no association, um, and perhaps that uh, has something to do with uh, diet records not being an ac accurate reflection of what people actually take in. But at least I haven't seen a study which suggests greater intake of sugar is associated with preference for lower levels of sweetness. So the literature is generally consistent with acclimation, but we have to remember um, correlation does not imply causation. Um, to, to discover direction of effect, we need actual uh, controlled studies with random assignments and control groups. Those studies, unfortunately, are not cheap and they are not easy, so far fewer of them have been done. Um, one relevant study, uh, about 200 adult consumers of sugar-sweetened beverages, 
were assigned to uh, consume sugar-sweetened beverages for 12 months, uh, to consume beverages with low-calorie sweeteners, or to consume only unsweetened beverages. Uh, before and after the manipulation, people rated the sweetness of model beverages varying in sucrose concentration and also selected the concentration they liked most, similar to a bliss point. So after 12 months, the people who drank unsweetened beverages needed about a brick less sugar to achieve a given level of sweetness, uh, but sweetness didn't change for the two sweetened beverage groups. So this is consistent with a little bit of acclimation to less sugar, uh, but inconsistent with the idea that low-calorie sweeteners prevent acclimation. The bliss point also decreased for the unsweetened beverage group, with people preferring about two bricks less after the manipulation. Uh, the, sugar, the sugar beverage group had no change, and the low-calorie group was intermediate. So this study is broadly consistent with some little bit of acclimation, uh, but perhaps equivocal on whether using low-calorie sweeteners undermines acclimation. Good study, but it had a few limitations. Um, first, they didn't have a follow-up period to determine if perceptual effects persist after people are free to choose their own beverages again. Um, they also didn't include intermediate time points, uh, though similar, more recent studies suggest these kinds of effects might occur at least within a couple of months. Uh, finally, they manipulated the sweetness only of beverages and tested model beverages, so this may not reflect general adjustment of the palate, but rather learning regarding appropriate sweetness in that particular context. As far as I know, the only published long-term experiment to date that attempted to manipulate the whole diet was done at Monell in collaboration with PepsiCo. After a baseline month, adult consumers of sugar-sweetened beverages were randomly assigned to either continue with their diet of choice or to reduce their intake of simple sugars by 40% for three months. Uh, sugar intake was assessed via diet records, and the low sugar group was instructed to replace sweet foods with non-sweet foods and to dilute sweet beverages by 50%. So both groups then resumed their diet of choice for another month, uh, and each month people rated the sweetness and pleasantness of model foods and beverages varying in sucrose concentration. After three months on a reduced sugar diet, uh, model puddings were rated about 40% sweeter relative to the baseline with no change for the control group. For smaller intensity effects at two months, uh, at three months for model beverages, so both results are consistent with acclimation to lower sweetness. However, we didn't see any significant changes in the blood point for the ketone response. Um, so uh, maybe there's some small hint of a reduction here specific to the low sugar group, uh, but it, it's pretty small if so, and it wasn't statistically significant with our sample. Further, uh, when people resumed their diet of choice, the low sugar group went right back to eating the, the same amount of sugar as baseline, and the sweetness intensity effects completely vanished. Uh, from these results, we might expect that the sweet tooth could be more difficult to adjust than preference for salt. So though this study also had some important limitations. Uh, we did not actually control the diet, just instructed participants and assessed diet records. Our sample sizes were small, um, so power was presumably limited. Actually, we ran more subjects than the original Monell salt acclimation study, study which found clear effects on the bliss point, so that may say something about regarding how robust the effects are for salt relative to sugar. And we had no low-calorie sweetener group to determine if low-calorie sweeteners would undermine the, the intensity acclimation that we did see. So uh, we're following up with a similar design, uh, aiming to more to about double our sample size. Participants are provided with everything they eat, an actual controlled diet by our collaborators at the U.S. Department of Agriculture. Participants are adults for whom more than 10% of their baseline energy intake comes from diets, uh, one with replacement by low-calorie sweeteners and one without, provide about 6% of total energy for sugar, so below healthy eating guidelines with a little margin. Each menu item with added sugar gets a drastic cut. Uh, so this might be a better model of what would happen if all manufacturers drastically cut added sugars at once. So we hope to complete data collection around fall of 2024. A related study in progress at Wageningen University in the Netherlands, uh, the Sweet Tooth Study, includes a six-month diet manipulation uh, with half the diet provided, and the sweetness is manipulated by the proportion of sweet foods in that 50% provided. 
Uh, they don't have a low calorie sweetener group, but they have uh, a low, medium, and high sweetness group, which is an interesting twist. And uh, yet another study in progress, also funded by NIDCD, uh, is led by Julie Manella at Monell and, and Jennifer Fisher at Temple. Uh, and in toddlers over four months, they're manipulating uh, the, the, the snacks, sweet or less sweet, uh, with a one-month follow-up. Data collection there is complete, uh, but they're still doing analyses. Regardless, there are relevant studies in the pipeline. Okay, so sweetness uh, tends to be inherently appetitive, but there are substantial individual differences. Preference is higher in childhood to support energy needs for growth, uh, so expect sugar reduction to be more challenging in kids. There may also be increased preference in the elderly. Uh, maybe that has to do more with smell. Uh, we also know that uh, some people uh, tend to dislike strong sweetness, and there may be actually room for lower sweetness products for some people. A uh, possible question in that regard then, though, is if you give a, a perfect option for every person, will you be working to maximize sugar consumption at the population, or will, will you actually reduce it? Um, so that's worth thinking about. Uh, so what if, instead of adding lower sweet options, sweetness or added sugar and sweetness was substantially reduced in all products? Um, would low-calorie sweeteners uh, it, it, would adjustment occur and would low calorie sweeteners interfere with that? The bottom line is there's simply too few controlled studies uh, to, to give a good answer to that. However, if we compare the few available studies on sugar reduction with comparable studies on salt reduction, uh, effects on the preferred sugar level or bliss point seem to be pretty puny. Uh, so my take so far is that the, the sweet tooth, uh, it just may be less malleable than the taste for salt. Uh, regardless, the jury is out on that question. Um, so with that, I will pass it on to Dr. Alexander of Danone, North America. Thank you. Appreciate that. So thank you for the invitation to speak. Um, for those of you who don't know Danone, we're a leading food and beverage manufacturer with a global business covering dairy yogurt, plant-based food and beverages, coffee beverages, infant formula, and waters. In the U.S., you may be familiar with some of our brands like Dan & Yogurt, Oikos, Too Good, Silk, Happy Family, and Stoat Coffees. Danone's mission is to bring health through food to as many people as possible and has been committed to using business as a force for good. We're a public benefit corporation and one of the largest certified B Corps in the world. This is not new for us, as we have had a dual economic and social purpose since the 1970s. With expertise in fermentation and biotics, gut health, immunity, and medical nutrition, Danone has focused on bringing products that positively impact health since our founding over 100 years ago. Today, I will talk about two places where Danone has been actively involved in the discussion on added sugars that can provide inspiration for the food industry. First, Danone has a history of making meaningful health commitments externally. Sugar reduction and low sugar options have been a priority for us for many years, and it continues to be a priority in our health and nutrition strategy. Second, we leverage new and existing technologies to provide low and reduced added sugar options and continue to create products that delight the consumers. I'll give you some examples under each of these to demonstrate how industry can be an active partner in addressing the health and nutrition needs of the U.S. population. First, Danone has a history of being a leader in health and nutrition. For many years, a central part of our health and nutrition agenda has focused on reducing added sugar and creating low-sugar products. Between 2014 and 2020, Danone achieved a 12% reduction in added sugar across the yogurt portfolio and a 23% reduction in sugar in yogurts for children. In 2020, 42% of our global innovations were without added sugar. We, have been, we also have been recognized externally for these efforts. The Access for Nutrition Initiative ranks Danone's global product portfolio number one in product nutritional quality and healthiness. Of course, the scoring was not solely focused on added sugar, but also included other positive nutrition elements to give a holistic view of nutrition density. In addition, ATNI gave Danone the highest score on the relative healthiness of our products within product categories. So an example of this is our two good products in the U.S., which have 80% less sugar than the average flavored and plain Greek yogurt. And importantly, we make external commitments that we hold ourselves accountable to. In 2022, as part of the White House Conference on Hunger, Nutrition, and Health, we made commitments to improve the nutritional quality of our portfolio in the U.S. 
We committed to having greater than 95% of our children's portfolio having a total sugar at or below 10 grams per 100 grams. We have several active projects and are well on track to meet this commitment ahead of the 2030 schedule. And globally, health and nutrition continue to be a central focus for Danone. Earlier this year, we released the Danone Impact Journey, our global roadmap to deliver on our mission. A critical pillar of this, health and, of this is health and nutrition, with specific goals around nutrition for children. This brings us to my second point, how do we do this? We do this by pushing ourselves to be creative and innovative and to develop technologies that both reduce sugar and meet consumers' expectations. We use a wide range of approaches, and I'll give you a couple of examples. First, let's talk about technology. Danone's roots are about differentiation through science and technology. An example specific to yogurt is the choice of yogurt cultures. The sourness is inherent in yogurt. It comes from compounds produced by the bacterial strains used during fermentation in yogurt production. We can selectively choose different strains of bacteria that lead to less sour notes in the yogurt, thereby reducing the amount of sugar to create a balanced product. One example of being able to reduce sugar and create great tasting products. The second example on the science side is sensory science. The perception of sweetness is multidimensional, meaning the flavor, texture, and aftertaste all influence consumers' perception of the sweetness of the product. One interesting example here is flavor. In the U.S., certain flavors are often paired with sugar-sweetened products, like vanilla flavor. A well-established effect is that if you give someone a straight vanilla flavor in water, our brain associates it as having some sweetness because of our experience of eating products that have vanilla and sugar. We can use these types of interactions to reduce the sugar in our products by increasing the flavor intensity. This creates a great tasting product while again being able to reduce added sugar. Along with these technologies, it is also critical that we understand the sweetness preferences of consumers. This is a promising area that has shifted over the last decade in multiple categories. For example, we know that a larger percent of people prefer unsweetened almond milk today than they did seven to 10 years ago. That means a greater percent of consumers prefer a product with less sweetness intensity. This allows us to anticipate these trends and bring products with lower sweetness intensity as well as low sugar into the marketplace. In conclusion, scientists love a challenge. And our challenge to our scientists and our partners is to make great tasting products and reduce added sugar. We are committed to innovate and leverage technologies that create these products with no low added sugar. Thank you. Great. Thanks, Aaron. I will take the ball from here. Um, thanks, everyone. Melanie Condon from Cured Dr. Pepper. I lead our corporate strategy on health and well-being. Um, first, just want to thank the FDA for inviting me here. And what I'm going to do today is speak briefly on the ways that Cured Dr. Pepper has been looking at merchandising our Better For You beverages and partnerships with our retail partners. You know, KDP, we're uniquely positioned with this wide portfolio of both hot beverages in the coffee category as well as cold refreshments in categories like carbonated soft drinks, sparkling water, water, juice, tea, um, applesauce. So we've got this really wide portfolio of well-balanced beverages, and we've got those treat occasions, but we also more increasingly have those low-added sugar, low-calorie beverages as well. So we're trying to provide options to meet every consumer need. But to meet that consumer need, first and foremost, we need to be there where the consumer is shopping. And we have to be visible for all consumers. So when it comes to playing our part in reducing added sugar, we're really particularly focused in how and where our better feed products are showing up, and particularly in those communities of highest need. So as at KDP, when we look at our portfolio and we think about the greatest impact we can have on health and well-being, it's really in three main ways, innovation, renovation, and distribution. So innovation and renovation, those are those areas that are in our four walls, right? It's how we're reducing added sugar. It's how we're increasing different flavors, how we're innovating in white spaces and maybe acquiring different brands. Distribution is that piece that takes partnership. So, of course, it's how we're getting those products on shelf, but then it's up to the retailers on how they're being positioned, where they're being marketed, and that becomes a partnership between us. So that is where, over the past year, we've really been focusing on that distribution retailer partnership aspect to look at our strategies on reducing added sugar. So let me give you an example of some of the distribution uh, focused health and well-being work we've been doing. Over the past year, we've been working with a retailer um, called Stop and Shop in the Northeast. Many of you may, may be familiar with them. Um, and we worked together on this innovative pilot program to market better for you beverage options in an under-resourced community. We kicked it off in
August of 2022, and we tested different in-store marketing and merchandising strategies um, to prioritize placement of KDP's Better For You beverages in a Stop and Shop location outside Boston in the Roxbury neighborhood. So our core hydration water, buy some Snapple uh, products, as well as two brands we distribute, Evian and Polar, those were the products we were using um, in places like end caps, pallet drops. We had a checkout cooler. Um, and the really cool thing about this store is that they actually had just remodeled it to have a retail dietitian in-house. So there was a dietitian office that was given different nutrition education materials and was really embedded in the community and walked, you know, the store every day and met with the consumers. So they had a wall outside the retail dietitian office of different beverages that met uh, the Stop and Shop uh, Guiding Stars nutrition criteria, um, which also meet KDP's Better For You criteria. And we used that as a place to merchandise and, and um, uh, market our Better For You products. So from uh, August through the end of the year, we had all these incremental shelves and end caps and displays of those Better For You products. We had signs that said Better For You products are here, Better For You beverages, excuse me, are here. Uh, we had um, shelf tags um, and different uh, price promotions. And then what we did was we tracked those sales over that time period. And the end result was those beverages that we had on display and were marketing better uh, were sold uh, compared to the year before, um, had higher uh, sales compared to the year before. Um, and equally as important, the total beverage sales around that time stayed the same. So what that showed us is that when you position and merchandise these options, consumers can gravitate towards them, and it won't necessarily hurt any overall sales. Now, I have to caution, this was one pilot in one store, um, and there's other macro, you know, economic influences going on at the same time, but it showed us that pilots like this can work, and it can help to uh, achieve different ways that we're displaying um, beverages in store, and that there's more work to be done as well. But it's worth the effort to find these areas where we can uh, work with retailers and partner, um, and particularly, again, in these communities of need, to show up, you know, where we want to show up and have those displays be those reduced added sugar uh, beverages. It also opened up for me that this retail dietitian audience is an incredible group to work with since they, they know the food and beverage space so well, but they also know the community really well. So that is a tactic we've been taking over the past year and will continue on next year to find areas where we can uh, educate ourselves as well as educate communities with our retailers um, through this dietitian network. So that's a bit about what we've been doing. I, I appreciate the time, um, and I will pass it over to Aaron from the National Restaurant Association. Thank you so much, Melanie. Really appreciate the opportunity to be here. Uh, thank you to the FDA for having the National Restaurant Association. Uh, as we said, my name is Aaron Frazier, Vice President of Public Policy. Uh, today, I'm here to discuss our Kids Live Well program, which was established to help parents and children make more informed decisions when they're dining out at a restaurant for menu items that prioritize fruit, vegetables, lean protein, whole grains, low-fat dairy, uh, while also limiting those unhealthy fats, uh, added sugars, and sodium. Uh, recently, we relaunched this effort to help restaurants provide healthier options for our youngest guests. Uh, we're calling it our Kids Live Well 2.0 program to align with the latest nutrition science, including the 2020 Dietary Guidelines for Americans and U.S. government regulators like the FDA's Nutrition Facts Panel. One of the key changes in this 2.0 uh, refresh of the program was the replacement of the total sugars criterion with an added sugars criterion. Previously, the program allowed a maximum of 35% of calories from total sugars in children's meals. But under the updated standard, there is no longer a total sugars criteria, but there's a maximum of 15 grams of added sugar allowed for meals and five grams for side dishes. This shift aligns with the most recent Nutrition Facts panel, which establishes an added sugars daily value of 50 grams. The limit of 15 grams for meals is about one third of the added sugar daily value while the five gram limit for side dishes is right around 10% of that daily value. So what does this allow us to do? This allows children's plates to be filled with better for you meals with main dishes like grilled chicken and shrimp, broccoli and beef stir fry, fish tacos, granola, steel cut oatmeal, and mini sandwiches, and a lot more healthy side items like low sugar yo yogurts, unsweetened applesauce, mandarin oranges, and brown rice. 
The restaurants that are taking part in this Kids Living Well relaunch, they're dedicated to offering a minimum of two meals and two sides that adhere to those rigorous nutritional standards. The association is also promoting healthier beverage options such as water, low-fat or non-fat milk, and 100% real juice as the automatic choice on their children's menus. By simplifying healthier choices and offering beverages with reduced added sugars, this is contributing to the overall healthier meals for kids. All kids living well meals, sides, and default beverage policies undergo a thorough review and validation by registered dietitians. Uh, the National Restaurant Association is we were proud partners in the White House Conference on Hunger, on Nutrition, and Health in September of last year. Uh, this event showcased the growth of Kids Living Well and how restaurant partners are dedicating themselves to education and promoting these items to make sure more and more customers know about these and they get the resources and tools to make better informed decisions. Today, we're really proud that numerous national brands, as well as some smaller re restaurant operators, are embracing a lot of these menus. Some of these include Applebee's, Bonefish Grill, Buffalo Wild Wings, Burger King, Carabas, Chipotle, Denny's, Dolphin Bar and Shrimp House, Firebirds, First Watch, Fleming, Golden Corral, Joe's Crab Shack, Outback Steakhouse, and Express, Silver Diner, and Subway. These brands have received Kids Living Well approval for their menu items, and they offer a wide range of Kids Living Well meal combinations. Taken together, there are 1,126 meal combinations and 91 sides, including 39 vegetable options available for kids living well criteria and 40 fruit options. I see that my time is running short, but I just want to say, in conclusion, our Kids Live Well program is making those efforts to promote healthier dining choices for children. With the participation of well-known restaurant brands and more education, more kids have options to healthier options when they dine out. Uh, thank you again for the, the panel and the FDA for inviting us, and we love the opportunity to share some of our recent work. Thank you. Hi, hello. So we're back in the panel. So thank you to all for sharing your innovative ways uh, that you are taking in your sectors to reduce added sugars. Uh, it's really good to hear from all of you. I have a question, so to Dr. Alexander. Uh, are some food and beverages categories better candidates for reformulation than others? What and what are some of the challenges? Thank you. Um, I think it's what's really interesting about any challenge is first is our awareness, right? And what we do, do know is that about 62% of adults are reporting that they're trying to avoid or limit sugar. 90% of parents or caregivers are reporting they also want to eliminate or reduce sugar from their children's diets. So the, one of the first hurdles is taken care of. Um, on our side, you know, we continue to innovate um, and to bring lower added sugar um, products through our technologies. One example I'll give is the use of ultrafiltration in our dairy products. So we're able to do this to reduce the amount of sugar overall in these products. Um, it's very successful in the marketplace. I mentioned earlier our two good products, which have 80% less sugar than the category um, standards, and consumers are responding very positively to this. Um, we also, in any technology development, you know, it's about partnerships as well, and we have an extensive global network of academics, suppliers, and startups um, that we work with, always exploring new technologies and how we can bring them to the marketplace. Um, one of the things I just want to mention as well is that as far as the categories, you know, it's important to look at the overall product and what it's doing even beyond added sugar. Um, and we often are looking at the shortfall nutrients that's called out by the DGAs, such as calcium and vitamin D, um, to ensure that we have a nutrient-dense and acceptable product to consumers as well. Thank you. Um, second question to Dr. Wise. So we heard in your presentation that there is evidence that reduced sodium intake leads to preference to lower levels of salt, but there is limited long-term evidence for sweetness exposure. Can you comment on whether the approach for voluntary targets for sodium reduction could be used the same way for added sugars reduction? Uh, yes. So, right, first of all, I'm not going to make any policy recommendations. Um, 
discuss this a little bit from a flavor flavor perspective. Um, so, what are the challenges? Um, you've heard a little bit about the flavor the, the flavor properties. Um, so, if you compare and contrast salt and sugar, in both cases, lowering concentration uh, will will to reduce generally uh, appetitive components, uh, sweetness and salt, respectively. Uh, putting controversial topic of long-term health effects of low-calorie sweeteners aside, uh, from a flavor perspective, there are more and better options for replacing lost sweetness. Uh, so, you know, rare sugars, we've heard a little bit of mention about that earlier, um, are expensive, but they taste pretty good. Um, and you can make blends that are that can have pretty good um, sugar-like sweetness uh, without uh, without punishing side taste for most people. We to do that with the natural uh, label that a lot of people want, without significantly raising price, which they also don't want, <laughs> which they don't want, um, it could be could be challenging. Um, so there's some 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 issues there. Um, also regarding masking of other tastes uh, or other components of flavor. Um, you know, whereas uh, low-calorie sweeteners do tend to mask bitterness like sugars do, the best available salt replacer, potassium chloride, does not do that. Um, so in some ways, sugar is a better replacement in the flavor profile uh, than salt substitutes are. Um, so in, in some ways, it might be a little easier if you allow yourself to use low-calorie sweeteners. Um, uh, but that's, that, that, that's a big if, I know, uh, for a lot of people. Um, so those concerns aside, um, if there were guidelines to reduce added sugar, you know, perhaps product-specific guidelines if that's deemed appropriate, um, will people's palates adjust such that they come to prefer lower levels of sugar? And as I discussed in the talk, simply put, um, the scientific literature currently offers too few, few controlled studies with random assignments to really give us a good answer to that question. Um, however, if we look at the sparse evidence that does exist, um, for now it looks like acclimation effects for sugar reduction uh, may be weak compared to acclimation effects for salt. Uh, so in this study, again, Gary Beecham and I did at Monell um, in collaboration with Pepsi, um, three months on a 40% reduced sugar diet, you know, increased intensity but had no effect on, on preferred concentration or so, a very weak effect. Uh, whereas to compare that in sodium, you know, they, they, for a very similar design study, they cut the bliss point in half um, in, in crackers with that. Um, so if I was forced to make a bet right now, I'd bet that the sweet tooth will be a lot more stubborn uh, than the taste for salt, uh, perhaps consistent with, with this kind of inherent um, energy drive that we may have left over from evolution. Uh, but uh, uh, it's probably from a flavor or a, a perceptual adjustment perspective going to be more challenging, uh, but the, the, the jury is out on that still, and maybe in a couple of years uh, we'll be able to make a more definitive statement. Yeah, Dr. Wise, thank you so much. We appreciate your perspective. Very important. Um, the last question uh, for Melanie and Aaron. How can food retailers and restaurants offer and promote foods with reduced amounts or without added sugar? Yeah, I'll, I'll kick off, Erin. Um, I mean, you know, that was sort of the point of my whole <laughs> my whole talk, but I think that the partnership between the brand and the retailer is incredibly important, and I think often misunderstood that one has more power than the other when it comes to promoting what's, you know, what's on sale and what's in these different incremental displays. So understanding that to begin with from both sides is really important to, to move both of your goals forward because here Dr. Pepper has, you know, really similar goals on health and well-being as Walmart and as Kroger and Ahold. And so sitting down and understanding that we are can work together to promote those is incredibly important. And then the other group I mentioned was the retail dietitians. And this has been sort of an aha moment for me, but this is an incredible group of professionals that are, work in stores, in retail, um, and not every grocery has retail dietitians, so that's a call out. Also, more retailers should be hiring retail dietitians, but they're an incredibly intelligent group of people that understand the dietitian and nutrition world, but more importantly, understand the community they're working in. And the theme I heard throughout all today was, you know, you have to understand the cultural implications of what products are on shelf and the community needs, and you can't just have something on shelf because it's the you know best version of that product. If it's not going to sell, then you're not making any difference there. So. So getting entwined with these um, professionals that, who their job really is to understand the community 
is incredibly important to make a difference. Um, and that's something we've seen and we're working hard to, to make sure we can continue to make those connections. Yeah, Thank yeah. thanks, Melanie. And just to echo what she was saying, you know, if we look at restaurants as kind of like the marketplace of, of food products and meals, uh, we think and we've learned that the Kids Living Well initiative that it's about education and it's about having all of our operators know that, like, it, it's going to benefit you to have these healthy options on the menu. It's going to we're building a, uh, a community of informed decisions and we're, hel we're helping customers manage a lot of their own expectations and saying like, yeah, there are better options that we can have and we're going to pursue those and make sure that uh, we can end up in a healthier place. Because uh, as Melanie, Melanie noted, you know, we, we all have really good people informing us through dietitian groups and, and through policymakers. But at the end of the day, we want to be there uh, at the ground floor with our customers to make sure that they're brought along with the journey, they had the education, and, and they can make those informed decisions. Thank, thank you, Aaron. Thank you, Melanie. Um, we're almost at the end of the section. And again, this is a good segue for the next panel, which is the community and the education panel of this meeting. So we thank you all very much for your participation. Thank you. Thank you. All right. I want to, again, thank our industry's panel on giving us their perspective on how to reduce added sugars. We will, again, take a quick and brief 10-minute break. You'll see a QR code on the screen, and feel free to grab that and uh, take a look at some of our additional resources. So, again, we'll be back in 10 minutes.
All right. Welcome back from that break. Again, uh, welcome to the Strategies to Reduce Added Sugar Consumption in the United States. Uh, we are with our third and final panel. I'm now going to hand it over to Lieutenant Commander Janisha Robbs to kick it off. Thank you, Michael. We will now move to our last panel for today. This panel features experts to discuss strategies for reducing added sugars in communities. I will now turn the meeting over to panel moderator, Janelle Gunn, Associate Director of CDC's Office of Policy, Partnerships, and Communication in the Division of Nutrition, Physical Activity, and Obesity. Thank you, Lieutenant Commander Rob, and welcome everyone. This is our last session of the day, Strategies for Reducing Added Sugars in Communities. I'm Janelle Gunn with the CDC and really happy to be here working with the FDA and USDA on this important topic. We have an outstanding panel for you this afternoon, and I want to make sure we make the most of our short time together. So let me introduce our panel. Uh, we have Sheldon Gordon, a colleague from uh, USDA's uh, Nutrition Education Training and Technical Assistance Division, where he's the director in the child nutrition programs in the Food and Nutrition Services. We have Crystal Register. She's a Senior Director for Health and Well-Being with FMI, the Food Industry Association. We have Gail Agawa, Program Specialist, Chronic Disease Prevention and Health Promotion Division at the Hawaii Department of Health. We have Ann Potempa, Health Program Manager in the Public Health Communications in the Alaska Department of Health. And we have Deanna Nara. She's a Senior Policy Associate for the Center for Science and the Public Interest, or CSPI. As we kick off the session, I want to share a few things that we're doing at CDC. And you may have heard about a little bit as we started today. And the first is, um, is our reviving of the Rethink Your Drink campaign. So the goal is to educate people about the amount of added sugars in many popular beverages, the negative health consequences of added sugars, and to encourage people to choose water for themselves and their families. We've used lessons learned from this campaign uh, for our work at CDC's CDC and for others that are working in efforts to reduce added sugars. Uh, we've been learning things about what images resonate, what messages resonate, kind of what consumers are responding to. We have new web pages that share information about added sugar, sources of added sugar, um, public health strategies to reduce added sugar, and those can be found on the CDC website along with some infographics and other images. And then lastly, I wanted to share uh, some information about our State and Community Health Media Center. This is a repository of free or no cost uh, ads and materials that can be used to support public health efforts. It includes a variety of nutrition, physical activity, and other disease topic areas, including the ads for the Rethink Your Drink campaign. Um, and some materials from other public health agencies from all across the country. So it's a great resource, a great place to to check out if you're looking at starting an education campaign or other efforts to see what's already out there and what you might want to build from. With that, I'd like to turn it over to Don Sheldon of the Department of Agriculture. Thanks. Thanks, Janelle. <laughs> Good afternoon. I'm Sheldon Gordon. I'm the Director for Nutrition Education Training and Technical Assistance here in USDA's Child Nutrition Programs. I'm excited to be here today as part of this esteemed panel. This is a wonderful opportunity to connect with you and to share with you a few things we are doing in USDA's Child Nutrition Programs to reduce added sugars. Our team nutrition, team nutrition materials are developed specifically for children and their parents and caregivers, and to also help integrate nutrition education into classroom learning. Our efforts include materials for home, cafeteria and community connections. The resources I will be sharing today are about added sugars and many common food and beverages and how to identify them offered in school meals programs and our child and adult care food program, which also known as CACFP. We are working continuously with schools and the food industry to reduce added sugars and encourage people to choose healthier choices. We do this through several different modalities, which I will share with you on the next slide. Here you will see just a few of our efforts, again, that we're doing in child nutrition programs and our team nutrition initiative. First, we have at the top left our living in the land of added sugars. And in this, students can learn or explore eating patterns and ways to choose nutritious foods and drinks low in added sugars, sodium, and saturated fats. 
and students will then use this learning from these activities to create a healthier eating pattern. In the center, we have our Nibbles for Health. It's a nutrition newsletter for parents of young children. And in this booklet for our CSAFP program, operators include 12 parent newsletters that is shared with parents of children ages three to five. The newsletters are available in English and Spanish and include information on a variety of nutrition topics, including added sugars and are developing healthy habits with less sugar addition. And it also includes activities for children. Going down to our bottom left, we have our calculating sugar limits for yogurt, as well as our calculating sugar limits for breakfast handouts. These are double-sided training worksheets that shows the steps to calculate whether a yogurt meets our CACFP sugar limits, um, as well as our, our sugar limits for our cereals. Um, they're English on one side and Spanish on the reverse. We also have other handouts, um, choose yogurts that are lower in added sugars, as well as choose breakfast cereals that are lower in added sugars. These are both available in Spanish, and these are double-sided training worksheets um, with no math ways to find yogurts um, as well as find cereals. In addition to that, we also have in our center, you'll see there's like a video. We have our CACFP Halftime 30 on Thursdays. This is a webinar series, and with these, we have also included um, information on how to reduce added sugars in our CACFP program. And these webinars are also included or recorded in Spanish. Up to our far right, top right, we have our 16-page training resource guide called the Best Practices for Reducing Added Sugars at School Breakfast for school nutrition professionals to present how to identify sources of added sugar and specific ways to reduce the amount of added sugars in school breakfast meals. And then lastly, I just want to talk about our Healthy Meals Incentive Initiative. Here in late 1922, FNS established a Healthy Meals Incentive Initiative, which is to provide direct support to school food authorities in improving the nutritional quality of school meals. And this is through a school food systems transformation recognizing FFAs or school food authorities and providing technical assistance with them. This initiative plays an important role in fulfilling FNS commitment to support the national strategy on hunger, nutrition, and health, a strategy that emerged from the historic White House conference the president convened last year. And this is to help create um, healthier food environments and enhancing the nutritional quality of school meals. And as part of this recognition program, we have our Breakfast Trailblazer Awards, which we are rewarding schools that have limited added sugars on their school breakfast. We expect to see some best practices on reducing added sugars in addition to other best practices that will transform food in the kindergarten through K-12 school marketplace. Just before I close out, I do want to say that we do have, this is, again, just a few of our team nutrition resources, and this, again, is focused more on our added sugar efforts. Um, but please feel free to visit our website to learn more about upcoming resources that are coming available. Um, you can sign up for our team nutrition newsletter, which will also highlight a lot of our resources, especially on added sugar. And then just lastly, if there's any questions that you have, you may feel free to send us an email with, from the email address that's on this slide. So my time is up, and I thank you for yours. I will now turn it over to Crystal Register. Thank you so much for the opportunity to speak on behalf of the food industry today about strategies to reduce added sugar consumption through meaningful education and community outreach efforts. With my current position at FMI, the Food Industry Association, um, I have perspective across the entire food industry as I work closely with food retailers that sell to consumers and producers that supply food. And I also note that I have the pleasure of working very closely with many of the experts that have already presented today um, from the government perspective and also from the, our industry partners. Um, today, I'm happy to share firsthand knowledge of the strategies our members are consistently engaged in to provide solid consumer education and community outreach. Registered dietitian nutritionists work across the entire food industry, sharing evidence-based messaging to empower consumers to include nutritious food and beverage options as they build meals and snacks in alignment with the dietary guidelines to ultimately enjoy family meals, and an overall healthy pattern of eating. I know it's been referenced many times today, but part of the historic 2022 White House Conference on Hunger, Nutrition, and Health, 
SMI members committed to reach 100 million consumers, as you can see here on the left, with evidence-based nutrition messaging in 2023 and are well on the way to reaching and exceeding that goal. Food industry dietitians help educate consumers on how to include nutrient-dense choices along with moderate amounts of foods and beverages that include added sugars, sodium, and saturated fat, all as part of a balanced, positive approach to eating and enjoying food, nutrition, and health. On the right side of this slide, note that industry-wide, there has been an uptick of over the course of the past decade to develop products with no or reduced added sugar to provide variety and choice for consumers. Reformulation is ongoing with many examples of great success with great tasting products that are significantly lower in added sugar. And quite often, registered dietitians are involved in all steps of product development, innovation, and reformulation. SMI members are committed to providing variety and choice for consumers across diverse portfolios of products that offer a wide range of sugar content to meet consumer preferences, from those containing no added sugars to those with small amounts of added sugars, some with the addition of non-nutritive sweeteners, and others packaged in smaller portions. FMI members have noted success with slow, gradual reduction of added sugars, which most often results in better consumer acceptance, particularly as has been noted today, when paired with education strategies to include and enjoy smaller portions while maintaining that overall healthy pattern of eating. Looking back to the left side of this slide, note that across the food industry, consumer education and community outreach strategies to help reduce added sugar consumption are widespread and far-reaching. Both retailers and product suppliers actively share healthy eating insights on company websites, on their apps, and specifically with content um, geared towards reducing added sugars, new product information, and specific filters for sugar-specific tags such as no added sugar, low carb, et cetera. Registered dietitians provide content for blog posts and direct email campaigns for loyalty customers interested in health topics. Put this slide together with just a few of the many, many examples across the industry. Frequently, dietitians affiliated with grocery stores, as mentioned in the last um, last uh, panel, this is just such a, a, a great, great value-added um, network of retail dietitians that tap into it, and the great work that's going on is, is exemplified in this slide. So dietitians are affiliated with grocery stores, commodity groups, um, and some of those with product affiliations provide science-based nutrition and health information in the media to include television, radio, print, and social media channels. Many retailers and product suppliers have links to informative videos on their website for easy access to quick tips and timely suggestions, all available free to the public. Registered dietitians provide topic and disease-specific classes, both in-store and virtually, with great connection to a wide consumer base. Retailers also use in-store signage, shelf tags, and brand-specific labeling to help consumers identify choices relevant to their own personal needs and health goals to include no added sugar, low added sugar, et cetera. In addition to providing label reading tips, recipe ideas, and lifestyle guidance, registered dietitians in the food industry are also providing one-on-one -on -one nutrition counseling, medical nutrition therapy directly to consumers, both in person and virtually. The positive health outcomes of MNT have been repeatedly studied and documented and prove again that the grocery store is an accessible destination for health and well-being. Across the entire food industry, both grocers and product suppliers are helping consumers eat healthier and learn more about how to reduce added sugar consumption. And now I'll pass to Gail. Thank you. Hi, everyone. Thank you for inviting me to speak today. So today I'll be presenting on the work of the Hawaii Department of Health team to develop, implement, and evaluate Sweet Lives, Hawaii's Sweetened Fruit Drink Counter Marketing Campaign. In Hawaii, more than 75% of young children consume one or more sugar-sweetened beverages daily. Often, these drinks are local products, including those seen on this slide. 
In 2019, Hawaii passed a Healthy by Default law requiring that healthy beverages be the default option in children's meals. Since 2011, we have been working with community partners to pass legislation that would impose a fee for selling sugary beverages at the distributor level. Funds collected would be used to support obesity and chronic disease prevention and control programs. It has been difficult to sway political will and gain public support for a sugary drink fee in Hawaii. So we decided to focus on education with the development of our Sweet Lives Communications campaign. We conducted formative research focus groups and found that parents and caregivers of young children believe that sodas are distinctly different from other sugary beverages and are bad for children. In contrast, all fruit flavored drinks are referred to as juice regardless of the amount of actual fruit contained in the beverage. This confusion is reinforced at point of sale. This photo was taken at a big box retailer. The local sweetened fruit drink product on the left is displayed next to the 100% orange juice and is $2 cheaper. Participants were aware that sugary beverages could lead to health problems. Diabetes in particular was mentioned in every focus group. This was not surprising considering that half of Hawaii adults have type 2 diabetes or prediabetes. But one surprising finding was that most participants did not connect sugary drinks with obesity. In our focus groups, few participants reviewed the ingredient list and instead relied on front of packaging claims when selecting beverages. Focus group participants often repeated industry messages like natural and 100% vitamin C as reasons for purchasing unsweetened fruit drinks. I'm sorry, for purchasing sweetened fruit drinks. Taking the information from the focus groups, we moved forward with developing the ads. We made sure to include counter-marketing messages, clear recommendations of what drinks are recommended for young children, and the long-term health effects of sugary beverages, including diabetes. We also ensured that the campaign messages conformed with the healthy beverage consensus statement and promoted water and unflavored milk as the healthiest choice. Paid media placements included TV, radio, digital, connected TV or OTT, which provides ads on streaming services like Hulu and Roku, ma ads, and in-language radio. We did a press release that resulted in an article in our statewide newspaper and distributed the campaign messages to early childhood education providers through their network email. To evaluate the effectiveness of the campaign, we conducted a pre-post cross-sectional study. We modeled our survey after Dr. Jim Krieger's study examining at two time points the types of drinks parents purchase for their child from a virtual store and the perceptions of harms of sweetened fruit drinks. Results of our evaluation showed that the campaign was effective at changing perceptions of the harms of consuming sweetened fruit drinks, but it was not effective at changing purchasing behavior. As this was the first year of our campaign, these results were not unexpected. As robust as a communications campaign as Sweet Lives is, more needs to be done. We believe a multi-pronged coordinated effort is needed to reduce purchasing and consumption of sugary drinks. First, we need to continue education in the form of Sweet Lives and other campaigns or messages that inform the public about the negative health effects of consuming sugary drinks. Second, an environmental change is needed, including front of package labeling reform and restrictions on beverage industry marketing tactics. Finally, policies, including healthy by default laws like Hawaii's that require healthy beverages to be served with kids' meals and fees or taxes that increase the price of sugary drinks are needed. Together, we can turn the tide. Hawaii is committed to this work, and we welcome, we welcome partnering with federal, state, and local partners. Thank you. Now I'm going to turn it over to my colleague, Ann Potempa, from the Alaska Department of Health. Thank you for the introduction. I am a public health communication specialist with the Alaska Department of Health. Today I'm going to share Alaska's Play Every Day campaign to improve healthy drinks served to Alaska families. 
I helped launch Play Every Day in 2012 as a one-year pilot project to support Alaska children to grow up at a healthy weight. That one-year pilot turned into a campaign that continues today. Our campaign follows the evidence-based social marketing process and is advised by nutrition and physical activity experts at the state and national level. Our Play Every Day campaign is integrated into our health department strategies to help Alaska children grow up healthy. About one out of three Alaska children is growing up with obesity or overweight. We call Alaska's campaign Play Every Day because it started with the goal of increasing opportunities for kids to get daily physical activity, or as we call it, to play every day. Later, we added messaging focused on reducing sugary drink consumption among young children, promoting water or white milk instead. This messaging supports our Healthy Alaskans 2030 priority to decrease the percentage of Alaska three-year-olds who consume a sugary drink every day. More than a decade after launching the campaign, Play Every Day is still running. Two evaluations have shown how effective the campaign has been at improving knowledge about drinks and ultimately changing and improving the drinks served to Alaska families. That's what I'm going to focus on today. I've mentioned that Alaska's Play Every Day campaign follows what's called the social marketing process. That means we prioritize an audience and make sure our communication materials speak to, reach, and motivate that audience. We use research methods to learn from our audience and evaluate our campaign's effectiveness. Play Every Day prioritizes reaching Alaska parents of children ages five and younger. Before we create our communication materials, we hold focus groups with parents to better understand what they know and what they don't know about sugar added to drinks and foods. We want to know, um, we want to know that so that we are making materials that are motivating to serve fewer sugary drinks and to serve more healthy drinks instead. And when we hold these groups, we make sure we're inviting families who say they're regularly serving sugary drinks to their kids. Here's what we've learned. It's hard for families to know what types of drinks have sugar added to them and just how much sugar is hiding in those drinks. Our message is focused on that to improve parents' knowledge about these drinks. And ultimately, our campaign goal is for families to choose healthier drinks. We just launched a new set of messages that encourage families to turn the drinks around. These messages help parents read the right parts of the labels. The front labels often have buzzwords and pictures that make the drink look healthier than it is. The front label can say organic, all natural, 100% vitamin C. It can say all of those things and the drink can still be loaded with added sugar. The front label can show pictures of fruits that aren't even in the drink. Alaska's messages help parents look beyond those flashy front labels. The truth is often on the back. That's where the nutrition facts label is. Finding the includes added sugars line helps parents pick foods and drinks with no or low amounts of added sugar. During our most recent campaign evaluation, we added questions at the end of, the, of an established survey run through our public health division. It's a systematic survey with a strong history in our state, and it's a great match for our campaign. Play Every Day is geared toward Alaska parents with preschoolers, and this survey is filled out by Alaska mothers of three-year-old children. We added a small number of questions to that survey, but they all hit the key areas of campaign evaluation. Did our messages reach our audience? Did they give parents new information about drinks they serve their kids? And did the messages change what drinks parents are serving their young children? We added our survey questions in early 2020, and they remain on the survey this year. In the first year of our evaluation, we analyzed responses from 476 Alaska mothers. 34% of them had seen the Play Every Day campaign about sugary drinks in the past 12 months. And then the ultimate goal of our campaign, 21% of mothers who saw Play Every Day said they changed the drinks they served their three-year-old because of it. You can read about our evaluation in an article published in the peer-reviewed Health Promotion Practice Journal. You can access our campaign materials in many ways at no cost. One, is the, one of those is through our website, playeveryday.alaska.gov. Another way is through the CDC State Community Health Media Center. Thank you very much for inviting me here today. I, I, my phone number and email is on the slide. I'm happy to continue the conversation. And right now, I'm going to pass this off to Deanna. Thank you.
Hello, everyone. Thank you, Anne, and thank you to the FDA for centering the sugar reduction efforts of communities across the U.S. My name is Deanna Nera, and I am a Senior Policy Associate and Licensed Nutritionist with the Center for Science and the Public Interest. Today, I'm going to highlight the recent passage as of last week of the Sweet Truth Act, legislation that was the result of a community-led campaign in New York City with the goal of improving the health of New Yorkers by promoting transparency and access to information about added sugars in the restaurant setting. Like many cities across the country, New York is facing alarming increases in diabetes in both adults and children. Almost one million residents in New York City have type 2 diabetes, and nearly one-third are not even aware that they have it. Managing diet-related diseases like diabetes can be extremely challenging for people, especially those that must navigate food environments that work against them. And not everyone has access to the same food environments. For example, a study of New York City fast food restaurants found that these are disproportionately located in predominantly black and Hispanic communities, meaning they face higher exposure to fast food. This is a product of residential segregation that is rooted in historic policies like redlining, disinvestment, and targeted marketing. New York City has over 2,000 chain restaurant outlets, and these fast food and fast casual restaurants promote and normalize foods and drinks with exceedingly high levels of added sugars, amounts that far exceed the FDA's daily recommendation for consumption and are linked to increased risk of chronic disease. The average default fast food combination meal in the U.S. contains 68 grams of added sugar, which is 136% of the daily value for added sugars in just one meal, with most of these added sugars coming from fountain drinks. Consumers have a lack of awareness regarding the amount contained in menu items, and in fact, no one can tell them how much added sugar is in these items because the FDA has not yet required this information to be disclosed for restaurant foods. The Sweet Truth Act is legislation that helps to fill this gap for consumers by requiring added sugars warnings to be placed next to items on chain restaurant menus that exceed a day's worth of added sugars or 50 grams for a 2,000 calorie diet. These types of warnings are essentially a form of nutrition education for consumers. They provide easily interpretable information to consumers about food and beverage items that contain excessive amounts of harmful nutrients like added sugars. These warnings are an objective, accessible, and widely supported tool that can help individuals identify and avoid foods with excessive amounts of added sugars. Policies like the Sweet Truth Act that require warnings on foods and beverages that are high in added sugars benefit community health by nudging people towards healthier information and choices and increasing access to information, um, as well as pushing companies to reformulate their recipes and products to avoid the warnings. Warnings also help us to address the misleading effects of marketing practices that misrepresent the healthfulness of foods and normalize overconsumption. Over the course of a three-year campaign, we worked with community members and advocacy groups like Interfaith Public Health Network to organize and build a coalition of more than 180 faith groups, small businesses, and community-based organizations, as well as over 150 medical and public health groups in New York City. The coalition worked with co-sponsors, Council Member Keith Powers, and Council Member Lynn Shulman, resulting in City Council passing the bill in two phases, the first being an added sugars warnings bill on prepackaged menu items in 2021, and the second extending coverage of warnings across the full menu just last week on November 2nd. These bills serve to form the first community-led added sugars disclosure policy of its kind in the United States. Unfortunately, this victory is bittersweet. Due to the lack of federal requirements for chain restaurants to disclose added sugars information, the city decided to tie bill implementation to the updating of FDA regulations that would require restaurants to disclose added sugars. While some items can be covered now using the information from the nutrition facts on prepackaged foods, the full impact of the community's work and desire to improve the health of New Yorkers will not be seen until FDA acts. These developments add new urgency to the FDA's work in reducing added sugars in the U.S. food supply. The agency now has a key opportunity to act in support of New York City communities, as well as other communities seeking to address added sugars in restaurant meals. 
As it happens, CSPI petitioned FDA to require restaurants to disclose the added sugars content of their menu items in January 2022 and have not received a final decision. We urge the agency to act quickly to ensure Americans have access to the information they need to make healthy choices for themselves and their families. Finally, and most importantly, I want to recognize our community partners and coalition members who worked tirelessly to pass the Sweet Truth Act to improve the health of all New Yorkers. May their work be an example of the powerful work that we can do together to improve the health of Americans. Before I close, I did want to draw your attention to another CSPI petition. In April of this year, CSPI petitioned the agency for a voluntary across the food supply initiative to reduce added sugars in those food categories contributing to the most, the most in the food supply. We urge the agency to act on that petition as well. It has the potential to both inform consumers and induce industry reformulation. And I will leave you with my contact information and I will kick it back to you, Janelle. Thank you. Thank you, Deanna, and thank you to all our panelists for a great session today and great information. We have just a few minutes for questions. Um, so I'll start, and um, the first question is, given the strategies outlined on this panel to reduce added sugars in communities, what are some of the barriers to successful implementation? And I'll hand it over to my colleague, Sheldon Gordon, first, whose name I messed up at the introduction. So my apologies. And the question is yours. Sure. No, I think definitely some of the things that we can do to help make sure that we get those barriers is really, again, like going back to um, some of the material that I was talking about earlier, really making sure that parents have a better understanding and the caregivers have a better understanding of, you know, where the fine added sugars in a lot of these food items and trying to reduce them as much as possible, but again, without sacrificing the taste. So I think really just making sure, again, um, that we really try to get those nutrition education efforts really into the hands of the right folks to get them out to folks, get them out to the parents and caregivers. Thank you. Um, Anne, anything to add? Sure. I think social marketing campaigns like the one I talked about in Alaska and the one Gail talked about in Hawaii can be really effective to run alongside other strategies to improve knowledge and change behaviors. Um, but two barriers to success for those campaigns are being too general in the health goal you're addressing and, and too general in the population you're trying to reach. Uh, campaigns can reach a variety of different audiences, but it's really important to pick one because that really allows you to learn from your audience and work with them to make sure your messages are using words and imagery that resonate with your audience, that your messages can move your specific audience from where they are currently at to sort of the next step that improves their knowledge and leads to positive behavior, behaviors like choosing healthier drinks. Thank you. Um, Gail, any additional barriers? Um, yeah, I think that, like Anne was saying, that it takes a lot of research um, and effort to make sure that the messages that we put into our communication communication campaigns resonate with the audience, and that um, it will cost money. So focus groups, um, message testing, media placements, evaluation, all of that requires funding. And so if a uh, a city or a state or organization that plans to do a communications campaign doesn't have sufficient budget, then it could impact um, the quality of the campaign and the outcomes of the campaign. And how about you, uh, Deanna, and any additional barriers? Yes, um, in the context of New York City's passage of the Sweet Truth Act, I think the biggest barrier is the lack of requirements for restaurants to disclose added sugars. Um, passage of this bill provides a key opportunity for the FDA to actually act directly um, in support of communities like New York City that want to positively impact public health. And again, um, we just urge the FDA to act as quickly as possible to ensure that Americans actually have access to the information that they need to make these informed decisions uh, for themselves and for their families. Family. Thank you. And Crystal, we'll close out our time together with a question for you. Some of the added sugar reduction efforts we heard about today were focused on young children. However, many groups in the U.S. Um, overconsume added sugars. So are there certain populations that should, we should focus educational efforts on, and how might educational approach vary by different populations? 
Yeah, I think there's a great question from my perspective, especially mentioning, um, as I did, the good work that's going on across the whole industry, especially by the, the registered dietitians. Quite often when the grocery store is the destination for information and resources and, you know, what can I what can I use as a swap? What can I add to my shopping cart? That's not going to affect just one individual. That's going to affect the whole family. So you may be working with a grandmother that now has something different in her freezer to offer to a, a child. So I think the messaging and education, and I think I just want to note, too, um, kind of ties into your last question about barriers. It's just raising awareness. I showed that that slide of all of those different resources that are in public-facing space and just the synergies that are going on. Quite often, that's where you can find the SDA labeling education tools that Claudine Cavanaugh mentioned. You can find the USDA MyPlate partners all across the whole industry. So you can find all these different campaigns working together and landing in the grocery store, landing on these websites and in apps and in, in the information that registered dietitians just instinctively tap into the credible materials and resources provided by um, the great folks I even on this panel, you may find a team nutrition link in a grocery store where a registered dietitian is doing a healthy eating campaign for children, and then that goes to all age groups that parents can hear the same messaging and, and um, grandparents. So hopefully that added, they answered that in a, in a, a kind of a global way, but I think it's, it's um, you know, really meeting consumers where they are and seeing the grocery store as a destination. Thank you. Well, I really want to thank the panel this afternoon and thank the audience. Um, there, there was a lot of great resources shared, materials, things that um, folks could build on as they think about community strategies and efforts they might be considering. Um, I appreciate everyone's interest in reducing added sugars. And with that, we will close this panel and return it back to our moderator. Great. Thank you so much, Janelle, and all of the panel speakers for discussing the various strategies for reducing added sugars in communities. And today we heard presentations on a wide range of topics, including an overview of added sugars labeling regulations, a personal account of the challenges related to embracing a healthier diet, and strategies um, that are taking place to reduce added sugars consumption at a local and, and global levels as well as the panel discussions that we just heard from various perspectives. And following today's public meeting, we will host facilitated listening sessions tomorrow and Wednesday to offer participants the opportunity to provide feedback on what was shared in today's meeting and share information on next steps to reduce added sugars consumption in the United States. We have developed a few questions for the listening sessions tomorrow to help foster a dialogue among the participants and those along with the listening session logistics can be found on FDA's meeting webpage. Registration to attend the listening sessions close on um, October 20th and all registered participants have received confirmation and additional information on how to participate in the sessions. The FDA will review input received at the public meeting today in our listening sessions and in response to a regulations.gov docket to determine next steps in consultation with our federal partners. As a reminder, we encourage everyone to submit comments to the docket by January 22nd, 2024. And there is a document entitled How to Comment posted onto FDA's public meetings webpage and this document provides additional information to consider when submitting comments. A recording of the public meeting will be posted on FDA's public meetings webpage shortly, as well as a meeting transcript, and that will be posted in a few weeks. And we will also have a summary of the themes shared in tomorrow's and Wednesday's listening sessions. Thank you for your time and attention today. We will now adjourn the meeting. Have a great rest of the day. Okay, we are clear. Great, great job, everyone. All right, let me pull up. Uh, here we go. I'm going to unmute people. Claudine.